and or broadcast of this meeting is being made at the direction of the board and this recording and or broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Let's call the roll. Mr. Talio. Here. Ms. Spicer. Here. Mr. K. Here. Mr. Ivanovich. I'm here. I'm also here. All board members are present. Uh, let's see, D2 agenda approval. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? So move. So move. Ah, second, second. Any discussion? Motion by Vladimir, second by Shali. We will do a roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Shali? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. I vote yes, agenda is approved five to nothing. Moving on to closed session report. No action was taken in closed session. We will move on to section E, personnel act, consent items. <clears throat> we only have one. Would anyone like to pull our consent item or make a motion for approval? Um, I move to approve the consent items as presented. Second. Motion to approve made by Vladimir, seconded by Shali. We'll do a roll call vote unless there's any further discussion. Steve. Uh, yes. Jessica. Yes. Shali. Yes. Vladimir. Yes. I vote yes. The motion passes five to nothing. <clears throat> All right. Moving on to F1 LASD learning plans. Mrs. McGonigal will prevent an overview of self-paced learning plans that will be used in the fall as part of the blended or virtual models of school. Sandra. Excellent, thank you. So Marcy, I'm hoping you can, perfect, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to spend some time tonight just talking through a little bit the learning plans that we developed conceptually and then share some um, examples or models so you understand the board and the public understands how we will be using learning plans in the coming year. So next slide. So we took uh, feedback, as you know, from teachers, from students, from parents around what worked in the fall and what are in the springtime and what were struggles of emergency remote learning. And we really took that feedback to develop a system for wayfinding or really a way for navigating in an organized manner um, how students can do virtual learning when they're not in person at school. Um, so this idea of the learning plan was birthed, was developed um, based on this feedback and really a way for us to make sure we can remain flexible in the coming year, depending on what happens. Um, that kind of flexibility within our continuum, knowing that we're going to need to flex very likely throughout the course of the school year. Um, and the navigation itself within the learning plan that you'll um, see a little bit really was designed to allow teachers to uh, focus their time when they have students in person, or if it were in 100% virtual, how they can best focus their time in that small group, kind of person to person live teaching, um, and less about having to think about each and every day, what do I need to post? What do I need to make a video for? What homework, what assignments, kind of that was the feeling for teachers in that emergency remote world. And we wanted to get rid of that and create a system for students that was manageable. Next slide, thank you. So learning plans have two parts. Each and every plan begins with an introduction and every plan, and this is regardless of grade level, regardless of subject area from our specials to our core content classes, follow a similar template. Um, we're using Google Slides as the foundation of our learning plans. Um, many of our teachers, not all, but many of our teachers um, in spring used a slide deck as a way to kind of have students navigate through their learning. So we're building off of that. So each of the learning plans begins with an introduction. Um, it's five slides that really the intention is to kind of paint a very high level picture of what a unit of instruction is supposed to teach and how students are to navigate through the learning. And then you get into the learning plan itself, kind of the daily lesson um, that is happening virtually. So as an example, next slide. 
we'll take a closer look at um, the introduction slide. So Diane Wharton and Riley Hagen over at Egan, were, uh, Diane teaches at Gardner Bullis now, um, but were nice enough to let me borrow some of their slides that they worked on as they went through the professional development. Um, so hopefully this will give you a little glimpse of how uh, the learning plans will be aligned for students and parents over um, next year. So next one, we'll start with the introduction. So this is Diane's um, friend, Noodle. <laughs> and so each of the learning plans begins with a simple title slide. Some of these I'm going to go through quickly. Next slide. And then um, the second slide is always a welcome to the unit uh, video overview. So we're not going to watch the video today, but this is Diane and sometimes it might be the classroom teacher, others, other times it might be kind of our expert, another expert teacher, whether that's a grade level colleague, one of our coaches, our instructional support teachers who are making videos. Um, and we're, we're also getting videos from Teachers College for our reading and writing project. But this video happens to be Diane. Um, and it's just a nice little, very short three or four minute welcome video to students and parents, letting them know what is this reading unit of study all about? What does it mean to build good reading habits? Uh, next slide. The third slide always tells kids and parents specifically what students are going to learn in this unit. So Noodle and his friend, I forget what the little friend's name is here, whatever, uh, tells us that students in this unit are going to learn some strategies to build reading habits. They're going to learn how to solve tricky words in their reading and they're going to learn the skills of how to do partner reading. Next slide. The fourth slide in the introduction of every single learning plan will look almost identical to this. And this is part of that wayfinding or navigation for students. So on the left, it reminds students that there are routines in learning. So today we're gonna look at a, a reading workshop, online virtual learning plan, um, along with a US history eighth grade plan each of them have pretty similar routines, but can vary slightly depending on the content. So it reminds students to follow the icons um, and you'll see some more of that and to pay attention when you see on the left there, lower left, that little materials bucket that there might be some supplies that you need for a specific lesson. In the middle, it reminds you that you have to be prepared for your class meetings. Some teachers might uh, attach or link a schedule right onto this slide so students can easily find what their schedule might be like, whether that's an in-person meeting or a uh, virtual meeting. And then on the right, it reminds students to stay organized. Um, I think you'll see in Riley's unit that uh, she has a link to the weekly schedule to help students with pacing of what her expectation is over the course of the week. We know we heard feedback loud and clear from our um, parents that there was some frustration uh, on their part without the teacher saying exactly what you need to complete and when you need to complete it, that it didn't often happen. So we wanna make sure that students have a weekly schedule that they're following for all of their different content areas. Uh, next slide. And then the fifth slide always is a helper in navigation and it breaks the particular unit up into sections or parts in um, reading workshops, sometimes it's called bends. So it just kind of helps organize kids. In part one, you're going to learn this. In part two, you're going to learn this. And in part three, you're going to learn this. Typically a learning plan might have uh, anywhere from three to five parts, maybe sometimes six, but it's usually in that range and things are linked right in. So if I clicked on the part one, it would take me right to the beginning of part one. If I started my learning plan, you know, several weeks from now and I was ready to go to part three, I could click there and just kind of move forward. So it's all about helping kids stay organized. Next slide. So let's transition now, that was first grade, and now here we are in eighth grade, and this is Riley's um, title slide. Again, letting kids know what the, what the unit is about. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, you don't need to view the video. Riley, uh, 
recorded her own video here welcoming students to the the particular unit in US history. It's all about freedom. So um, it's again a quick uh, unit overview that really highlights what students will be doing and how they'll be engaged and kind of how to navigate this particular unit. Next slide. Uh, history is somewhat similar to science in that it's often learned in an inquiry format, whereas Diane's reading slides told very specifically you're going to learn about how to solve tricky words, you're going to learn how to read with a partner, and you're going to learn some um, reading habits. In history and science, we often go from questions, what are the driving or guiding questions for this particular unit? So uh, Riley has laid out those questions for students that this, these are the questions that they're going to answer throughout this particular unit. Next slide. You'll see that same navigation slide and Riley linked right on there a pacing guide for students that tells them through the course of a particular week what her expectations are for which lessons they should be doing. And then next slide. And then Riley's unit has four parts and she kind of highlights for students and families what each part is going to cover. So if we move into, the, those are the introductions. So again, each and every learning plan will have those same five slides for students, uh, but then they're, they're going to get into the plans themselves. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. And so we've created a bank of icons for teachers to use. And we know that um, everybody loves a good icon, right? You can go to an airport anywhere in the world. And if you can read the icons, you can typically find your way to baggage claim or the taxi stand or what have you. We really wanted to um, empower students to have more independence, especially our youngest learners, where we, where we heard loud and clear that um, distance learning was a challenge for them, that a system of icons can help our English learners, it can help our youngest learners, um, and it just helps guide students to make sure they're doing what they need to be doing and to make it a little bit more clear. Next slide. So if we go in, we're back in first grade now, and this is Diane's um, uh, first lesson for her reading unit of study. And so you can see a couple of different things on here. Um, up in the upper right, you can see that this is slide one of two. So lesson one has two slides. Um, and you see a predictable routine. Pretty much in reading workshop, students will watch something, they'll read and practice, and then the next slide will tell us that they share. It's the same routine that they use in, in an in-person classroom, and we're really trying to bring that routine into um, our virtual world. Math has a slightly different routine, but we do know that with those icons and some predictable routines for students that it should build their independence. So on the right, it lets me know that I'm going to need my book bag that I got from school full of my first grade books that I am challenging myself to learn to read. Uh, I will start by watching my teacher's mini lesson. Again, that might be my teacher. Or it might be another expert teacher. This happens to be a, a lesson where Diane teaches a very specific strategy to students about taking a sneak peek of their book, that we read the cover of a book to understand what the picture is telling us might happen within this story, and we look closely at the words in the title. Um, so she goes through an engaging video, and then students will read and practice. Over on the right, we have um, the anchor charts that come from our curriculum that get built kind of day by day, lesson by lesson over time. Next slide. So the second part of this lesson is letting students know that during the share time, which is the part where they practice out loud or they hear each other, um, perhaps with a partner, that this will be part of your small group time. So if we were in our blended model, this would be happening in class where uh, Diane would make sure that every student knew how to do those little sneak peeks, that they knew how to read a cover and they knew how to read the title and take a guess about what the story might be about. Um, 
and if they were in a 100% virtual uh, option, that that would be what was done with the classroom teacher during that small group reading time, because we want to make sure that kids can apply the skills that they're learning. And then we see that anchor chart building. And as you got into lesson two, a lesson three, lesson four, those anchor charts build out as students learn additional skills and practice. Next slide. So now let's shift to eighth grade. Uh, this is Riley's first lesson. She also has a two slide first lesson here and uh, it's all about freedom. And so Riley filmed her own video that talks specifically about the Bill of Rights and the UN Declaration of Human Rights and asks students as a way to engage them in the video to take some notes in their notebook. And they were told that they're going to need their history notebook for this. Next slide. So once they watch that video and took a couple of notes, then they have some time to explore. And so Riley put together a slide deck with some really um, powerful images from back in time in US history all the way till this past June, um, and really is asking students to note in their notebook um, what freedom or lack of freedom does this particular image represent? So a really powerful lesson. Let's move on to the next slide. So if we think about learning plans uh, and how they're going to be used, I'm gonna come back to Riley's lesson in a minute, uh, but it's important to note that, again, this learning plan can be used across the continuum. So uh, this particular slide, slide really focuses on um, the blended model, but if, if families chose the 100% virtual model, you can replace that blue in, uh, in person at school to be virtual in small group with teacher. It kind of serves the same purpose. So the learning plan is the common thread of what's happening for students each and every day. They have uh, learning plans across all of their subject areas that they're going through at home at their own pace with a scheduled, you know, uh, teacher expectation this week, I want you to complete lessons blank through blank, or when I see you on this day, please make sure that you have X completed in time. And it's really the teacher's job to think through what is most important about what students are learning this week and how can I best engage them, whether I see them in person on their A, B rotation days or whether I'm meeting them with small groups in my virtual school world. And so uh, the learning plan really is that kind of common thread. Um, when teachers are meeting in our blended model, when teachers are meeting with students on their at-home days and their afternoon Google Meets or their Wednesday morning meet, it's a chance for teachers to, again, reconnect what's happening in your learning plan. These are the key things you're supposed to be doing this week. These are the key things you're supposed to be learning this week. What questions might you have? Um, how can I support you? Where are you finding some really exciting new information that we might want to talk about? And where might you be finding some challenges? Um, but that learning plan moves all the way along. Next slide. So when we think about, I know there was a question um, at the last board meeting about this idea of um, having to have completely separate teaching plans for that in-home or small group, uh, I'm sorry, for that in-person or small group. I really, we've been talking with teachers this week and last week, we want them to think about um, how to prioritize what's most important. So when we look and have students in class with us, how do we make sure that we're doing things that are hard to do virtually? when they are in with us in person. So we wanna focus on those active learning activities, those meaning making activities. And really what we would expect is when students came in person for their two days, that teachers are doing some, uh, review is not the right word, but re-engagement of what kids did uh, at home for the last few days. We would be teaching something new or in engaging them in some new learning experience and then we would want to be front loading students for their next few days when they are doing their at home learning. So that's kind of our own routine that we want to um, train teachers in. Next slide. 
So a little detail of what that might look like. So let's go back to Riley's US history world. Um, and we see that the same, whether you're in group A or B, if we're in our blended model here, uh, that all students are assigned lessons six through 10, lessons one through five, what, whatever week it might be. But there's a series of lessons that both groups are are assigned over the course of the week. And when I'm meeting with them in the afternoons, I'm checking in to see that they're making progress, but I'm really making a, a choice about what happens when I see my both groups of kids in person or in small group virtually. Next slide. And so if I were Riley, these are two images from that explore activity that she had in her lesson. Uh, I would really think about this is a powerful opportunity to have a conversation with kids and we know that to make meaning of really complex ideas like freedom is a complex idea. Um, and that in order to for students to make greater meaning, we have to have conversations. This is what people do to deepen their understanding. So if I were Riley, I would wanna pull up a couple of those images and it wouldn't matter to me if kids were in group A, rotation group A or rotation group B. This is an important enough concept that I really want to have a discussion over. It's kind of the most critical thing over the course of this week. So I would want to pull a couple of images up have a conversation about freedoms and really how are we analyzing these particular images, um, have some shared vocabulary, practice our conversation skills, which are teachable skills that we want kids to practice. And probably before they left me that day, I would want students to select their own image and that they believe represents freedom or doesn't represent a freedom and do a little description about why. That would be my check for understanding that particular week. So as teachers are looking at their lesson plans and their learning plans and really thinking about what is most critical, we want them to be thinking about what are kids coming to me with what's most important and how can I engage them? We really don't want kids just passively um, working when we do have the opportunity to have them in person with us or in our small groups in that virtual school world. Um, what else? Next slide. So, uh, I want to uh, thank both Riley and Diane again, and Riley uh, gave me permission to use it as long as I was uh, would tell you two different things. <laughs> One was she wants you to know, the board to know that creating learning plans takes a long time. And I want you to know that as well. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit through this slide. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that it does take a long time to create a high quality learning plan. I believe there are great benefits to our learning plans, but they certainly do take time to develop. She also wanted you to know that she finds the learning plan a really helpful tool in um, creating virtual learning opportunities for kids, that she sees that it's a really helpful tool, but that it does take a lot of time. So when we go to this particular slide right here, we know we, we need to make it manageable for our teachers. We've started by looking at our TK5 teachers who are our multiple subject teachers. Um, and to see how we can best support them in the development of plans. Because of course, when our teachers are working with students from 8.30 to two every day in person, um, students who are not in person need to be engaged in learning. And so that is where the learning plans come in. So we're providing ready to go learning plans for, for our TK5 teachers in science and social studies. Um, we committed to creating partially created learning plans in math, but I think we're going to be able to pull off fully created ready to go plans, but we'll see if we get there um, with the team who's working on them. And then we've been encouraging our teachers to really do some grade level collaboration, some divide and conquer around the English language arts, the reading, writing, and phonics, but we have committed to purchasing the um, videos from Teachers College that supports all three of those um, 
areas, reading, writing, and phonics for our primary groups. Uh, we heard from our sixth grade teachers. I think a couple of them spoke at the last board meeting and we've received a couple of emails. So we have a, a time to meet with them later this week to really understand how we can best support them. Right now, most of our plans for our 6-8 teachers have um, included math because our math teachers, many of them are um, multiple, same subject, but multiple course uh, math teachers. So we want to make sure that it's manageable to them. And then of course, we will reach out to our junior high folks um, across the board to, to see what type of support they do need in the development of these plans. Um, what else? So again, I want to acknowledge the idea that they do take time to put together. And, um, you know, I think it's a, a, a shared sense that we're in the middle of a pandemic and things just have to look a little bit different. And there does need to be more planning and more collaboration and coordination than there has been before, that there has needed to be before. Um, which is why I've advocated for that Wednesday um, additional planning and collaboration time for teachers on that Wednesday, because I do think that they will need more time, not only for the development of learning plans, but just to uh, work with their colleagues to make sure that our students are getting the best and that our teachers are working um, in a coordinated effort and we're not doing a big duplication of efforts, which was what happened in this past spring. But in the end, I do believe that the, the learning plans are going to result in a better quality for our students with more alignment to give us that flexibility that we're going to need as we swing across our continuum a little bit and ultimately allow teachers to not have to go day by day but really have some plans in place that support the virtual world so they can focus on that in-person or that small group world. So I am happy to answer questions. I think that is the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions um, that the board might have about learning plans. All right, thank you, Sandra. <clears throat> um, let's do a round of board questions before we go to public comment, shall we? Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sandra. That was really great. It sounds like an incredibly rigorous model for our kids. I just had two questions and they're just kind of, you know, just to help me understand. Um, when you're talking about the ready to go and partially created learning plans, who is creating those learning plans? So we have um, our, some of our instructional support teachers have created uh, science plans for every grade level TK5. And I think they're done with their first two science units kind of start to finish. They started working on those in June. Um, I have a, a pool of, I'm not exactly sure how many because they've been networking out, but two to four teachers working on social studies plans um, for again, for that TK5. Um, we have a couple, uh, one of our math IST is working on I think she's doing the seventh grade math plans. Karen Wilson, our STEM coordinator, is doing a sixth grade math plan. Uh, there's kind of packed together. Our math instructional support teachers are working on um, the math learning plans. Okay, so great. pretty much people out of my office, Shelly. <laughs> no, excellent, because I'm sure parents would want to know that these are our own LASD teachers. Absolutely. Our own LASD staff who are coming up with the kind of high quality education that we are known for. So for thank sure. you. Yeah. Um, and just, uh, I'm sure parents may want to know, when kids are using their notebooks, like for example, the free response in the history notebook, yep. um, are, how are, are teachers checking that, that the kids have actually answered those free responses? I'm assuming it's a physical notebook that's in the child's home. It is a physical notebook. Some of our teachers I know like a digital notebook as well, you know, and that varies kind of age wise and what have you. So we've really talked with teachers about um, kind of two different things. One, there are just assignments. So there might be a notebook prompt or what have you. And a lot of times we want that's part of processing of learning, right? I'm listening to a video or I'm reading something and I need to process in some way. So I'm taking some notes. Uh, I don't know that we really want our teachers 
spending every moment tracking every little assignment like that because that be can become in and of itself a huge job. But what we do want is some accountability that students come prepared for a discussion uh, mm -hmm. or they're prepared for sharing their work, right? That they uploaded into something and what have you. Um, but we do have, and I didn't really speak to it, but if you saw that whole bank of icons, one yeah. of them, and there was one that was colored yellow and one that was just black and white, we call key assignments. Right. Those are the more important assignments that we really want teachers to be. It's kind of more of a cumulative assignment or a, a long way into the process assignment. Those are the assignments that we want teachers to be tracking down, providing feedback, and kind of following that really good feedback loop. Um, because not all assignments are created equal, for sure. All right, thank you so much. Jessica? Yeah, um, I think this question actually fits in with, um, with the learning plans. Um, I think you kind of hit it when when you uh, when you presented, but I just wanted to re-ask the question. Um, we've heard from some of the teachers um, at the last board meeting and, and through some of our emails that um, that blended learning is is more work. Uh, is that true? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it is it is more work. They you know our teachers do an amazing job and they plan thoughtfully and every teacher has a system that has really worked for them. Um, I think a lot of the extra work or additional work comes with the idea that we're asking teachers to kind of shift the way that they've planned or presented uh, curriculum and materials for students into this more aligned system, right? In the end, it's going to be, I truly believe, it's going to be easier for our teachers once they're in the active week by week working with students. But there is a lift to get those plans up and ready. And I do believe those Wednesdays are, are critical for our teachers to have the time to do that, that good work and to do it collaboratively, which is you know something we've been really working toward over the last few years, the, the whole collaborative work of our teachers. All right. And Jessica, I'll just add, uh, it's, they're really going to be critical as we move through. You know that the, the next agenda item is about this continuum mm -hmm. um, that we expe expect the next year to live in. Mm -hmm. And as we move in and out of uh, blended and in-person and virtual, oh. these are going to be critical for the continuity of learning for our students. Absolutely. Great. Um, and do you think that other than how we're showcasing how we're teaching, is it is the curriculum any different this coming year? Um, or, or is it the same, just taught differently? I, I think it's primarily the same and taught differently. I mean, in the spring, we were really only focused, especially at elementary, on core subjects, and we really want to bring back the full the full curriculum for kids, much more comprehensive, bringing back science and social studies. We've got, I didn't even talk about, we have some STEM projects that are being developed as well because we know that that's an area that students love, but you know, those things were not prioritized in the fall when we went into emergency learning and we're really now trying to bring back the full curriculum. I think the challenge is um, the pacing and so we will have to see, as I met with teachers in the spring and was asking kind of grade level by grade level, how did you do with what you would hope to teach by you know June, whatever, um, and what was the reality? And uh, our teachers really were able to teach the curriculum that they expected to teach in the spring in those subject areas um, for the most part. And so I, I'm hopeful that we're designing something that will continue kids moving forward in their curriculum and have a more comprehensive experience. All right, let me just see if I have anything else within this uh, realm. I think that's it for, for this agenda item. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, can, I go, or can I go, Brian? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, two questions, but first a comment. 
um, it seems to me that that this uh, this blended model uh, where you have some part which is um, in person and then some part which is is virtual actually can can serve to expand uh, the learning opportunities uh, for kids and expand the, the the teaching techniques or methods so it's actually uh, there, there's there's hope I, 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 I see a lot of potential uh, there uh, for uh, better learning opportunities, if you want. Um, my questions were, uh, the first question has to do with assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something about how assessments might be done or might be, um, uh, what kind of assessments, how frequently they are? Uh, are they uh, formative assessments? Are there summative assessments? That kind of stuff, uh, you know, whether you've talked about that. And by the way, we're all learning in this. Sure. So it's, for me at least, it's perfectly acceptable to say, we're working on it. That's, yeah. You know. Thank you. So we, we know we certainly want to assess all of our students at the beginning of the year, what, what that time point is usually by, I'm trying to remember if we say by the end of September, we want to have a really clear handle on how our students have uh, hopefully progressed with reading uh, since last year. And so we will be certainly assessing them, I would expect, in person for our Fontes and Pinnell reading benchmark assessment. I would be very interested for the families who choose the virtual school option to also find a way to bring students in person, if possible, for that assessment. Um, but we can certainly, and we've been exploring what that looks like in a virtual assessment um, realm also over the computer. Um, our math curriculum has assessments kind of built in. The whole concept of formative, which is conceptually the assessments that teach us teachers what else we need to do to help students learn. And summative is typically in the kind of end of unit assessment. Um, you know, many of our all of our assessments, I would say, are really formative in nature. So I would expect that our assessments really model much of what happened in pre-pandemic timeframes. You know, having students in person, I know it was, it was a struggle for teachers to think about assessing um, only in a virtual realm. And so families, if we're able to bring students back um, to be able to assess in person goes a long way. And, um, but you know, our, our assessments are built into our reading and writing curriculum and into our phonics curriculum, um, our math curriculum, science I know is working on some assessments and social studies are probably more project-based than kind of test-based. Um, but yeah, I, it will be great, I know, to be able to really understand better than we could in spring how students are progressing in their learning. Okay, um, thank you, Sandra. The, the second question I had uh, was, um, how are we going to address students who are, um, are struggling? Um, uh, they, in, in, in the past, a teacher could go to a student that was struggling. And if um, three out of the five days are virtual, that's going to be harder. And I was just wondering if there was some thought about um, some, some ideas about how to, that, to do that. Yeah, we, we've talked a little bit in our plan, in our reopening plan about um, prioritizing students, you know, as we're able to bring students back on campus, that there might be students who need to be on campus more than two days a week. And uh, struggling is a very broad term. Some of our students struggled uh, perhaps really uh, less potentially academically, but even just struggled with the function of, of, of online learning. And so some of our students could benefit from being in person more frequently with some support to help them through the virtual learning. Uh, whereas other students really are behind or far behind academically and would benefit from being in their classroom more frequently. These are all details we kind of have to figure out what's possible and what fits guidelines and what have you. But, um, you know, at the least, we could do some virtual interventions, 
which are not the best way to provide intervention. And um, kind of at the maximum, we would want to bring kids back to campus more frequently to provide them additional services or additional supports. Um, have, you, um, have you considered uh, perhaps uh, taking students from several different schools who are at the same struggling stage and, and uh, intervening uh, 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 specifically for that particular uh, group? Or is that, would you prefer Virtually, to- Virtually, do you mean, Vladimir? Yeah, yeah. You because know, I had a really interesting conversation with Katrina Waters is our um, kind of reading specialist teacher over at Santa Rita, who's been doing reading intervention this past year. And she too transitioned into remote teaching. Um, and her feedback was very interesting and it helped me think through uh, that always relationships are important, but when you're working with struggling learners, whatever their particular struggle might be, that relationship is most critical. I think it would be a more of a challenge to take students from across schools when they didn't know the teacher or the like a familiar face from their campus. I think mm -hmm. it would be more of a struggle. Not that it couldn't be overcome and we build relationships and we do a great job with that, but it would be more of a struggle. Okay, sure, thanks. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Steve, any questions? A couple of clarifying things. I just wanna make sure I, I, I'm hearing correctly what you're presenting. One is, so go back to your example you used, Riley's history lesson is gonna be used at Egan and at Block for that unit, right? That's the idea. So now that's the idea. We have yep. to do it again, right? And then the thing I'm struggling with a little bit is delivery, is that if I'm exposed to that content during the week and I'm in cohort B, I've had time to think about it. So when I go to the conversation interaction live piece, I can see that doing that relatively easily. If I'm in cohort A, I haven't been exposed to the content as much before we have the conversation. If I'm following your example correctly. Sure. How do, do we stagger something slightly off to make that work better? Or am I just thinking? I think that, I, yeah, I think that would complicate things kind of unnecessarily. To me, the magic is actually more in the conversation. And this is one example, right? But the magic is more in the conversation. And it really, uh, if you've looked at that particular lesson and you did the exploration on your own and then you came in, you will be engaged in that conversation, right? You'll have some background knowledge, you'll be able to contribute to that conversation. But even if you haven't done that lesson yet and you just see some of those really provocative or interesting images come up, your engagement is going to be there and you will absolutely be able to participate. You'll be able to get something about, uh, from both the conversation and contribute to the conversation. And then possibly you'll be more engaged to go back and look at the rest of the photos that you hadn't yet seen. Um, you know, that's one example, but there are plenty of times each week where group A and group B might be doing something different because it matters more where they are in the sequence. In this particular example, it doesn't really matter, but sometimes it might. You know, I think of our reading and writing workshop where we really want kids every single day to be um, spending some time applying their skills. They're either writing or they're reading um, each and every day. And so when my A group comes in, I'm probably going to do a very quick a mini, mini lesson on what they should have done at home. And then we're going to be practicing those skills in small groups. My B group, a couple days later, I'm going to review a couple more skills, right? And have them practicing. So it's going to be close, but not quite identical. And neither group is at an advantage or a disadvantage, in my opinion. Okay. Um, I don't think I have any questions at this stage. Um, so we will go to public comment. Uh, looks like we have at least a couple people interested. Uh, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Um, also, please keep in mind that this is an opportunity for members of the public to provide comments to the board, but that in the interest of time and fairness, the board and staff cannot engage in a dialogue with speakers during our meeting. If you do have more to say or feel that your questions don't get answered or would like to have a further conversation with us, we encourage you to reach out to us via email 
at trustees at lasdschools.org. Um, I think, Marcy, if we can give each speaker two minutes, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I would first like to apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. Our first speaker is Catherine Evanhouse. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Catherine. We call her CJ. Looks like she dropped, so let's move to the next person and then we'll come back. Our next speaker is Amy Madsen. Hi there, thanks to all of you for your hard work. Um, I'd like to, you presented last week the plan um, uh, for approval this week. I think that's not enough time. Um, you heard uh, comments last week from parents and teachers and I, I didn't get the impression that, that people were bought in. Um, and it's disappointing that you are not taking into consideration any of that feedback. Jeff, you came out with an email after Santa Clara County came out with their directive on Wednesday. So there was no time to incorporate any feedback, you know, so that, 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 that's very disappointing. I, I do wish the process were far more collaborative. Um, uh, I think that you're basing this plan on the assumption that parents with multiple kids prefer a self-directed or self-paced learning, yet I don't see where that was surveyed or where that was specifically asked because that's, that's not what I'm hearing. Um, so I, I just think this is based, yeah, in any event, um, San Jose Unified School District um, announced that they're coming out with um, a blended um, and um, on-site and at home and they're using technology so folks can at home can listen to live virtual streaming. I would like um, our district to get in touch with San Jose and find out about this. There have been studies for many years that this is a possibility. There are handbooks on it. I think this should be considered. Um, Sandra, I don't know who you think is going to be doing the self-pacing and the self-directing for, for kids because it's, I don't think this plan is going to, to work. I just, um, I just don't see it happening. And the big flaw in this plan is that our kids are going to be home most likely not only three days, but five days, many weeks out of the year because one kid is going to test positive or a teacher and then that's going to wipe out the one or two days that kids, you know, do have uh, in the classroom. So that seemed to be a, a in any event, I, I, I implore the, the board not to approve this plan tonight. Please allow for more input and collaboration and a better plan. This one doesn't work. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Roberta Pine. Good evening, board. I want to thank um, the CNI department for the thoughtful process um, for how students will navigate in distance learning. But um, like many teachers, we're very curious and concerned about the delivery and the details that we still need to work out. Um, I'm also very concerned about the primary students, like the parents said earlier. Um, how are they going to really be navigating through all of this? They're going to need a lot of parent support to do this as well. Um, and it just seems that the, these learning plans really focus more on an upper grade system. And also we need time at the beginning of the year to introduce students to a lot of this. They may have had some experience in the spring, but as a third grade teacher, every fall I am introducing third graders for the very first time to Chromebooks and Google Docs and how that all works. So. Uh, to think that a TK through third grade is going to embrace this learning plan um, right away is a little misguided. And again, the parents are going to be really helping. Teachers are willing to work hard. We work 200% in this district for our students um, to make learning fun and engaging. Um, but we're being now asked to create content. And we've never really been able to do that before. And I appreciate CNI and all the people that are going to be creating content. 
but we're not designers of slide decks like my daughter who is a graphic designer um, in the workforce. Uh, and that's not our forte. We um, need to have that human connection with learning. We also need to model empathy for our students and grace for our students, especially for our country right now. And we need a little modeling of grace and empathy for our teachers. And we know that actions speak louder than words. And again, I truly appreciate everything LASD is doing um, and aligning, but um, I just think we need a lot more support and con consultation. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Sobel. Go ahead and unmute David. Okay. Uh, 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 Can you hear me? Yep. Still getting a little echo, but yes. Okay. That's better. Hello. Go ahead. You hear me, Brian? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead. Well, this is actually your spot. We were both waving our hands. Hi. Um, so thank you everyone for all your work. This is actually Melissa um, Sobel speaking. Thank you so much for all your work. And um, today's presentation was actually really helpful. It um, clarified a lot of questions that I had about the hybrid um, based on last week's meeting. Um, but I still have a lot of questions about the virtual only program. Um, uh, kind of three buckets of questions. So one is that Sandra, when you're going through the schedule, you mentioned that the virtual model would look a lot like the hybrid model, but I was just hoping you could clarify that a lot more. It, it sounded like instead of it being five days of virtual learning, that it would actually be two days of virtual learning, one day of collaboration, and then two days of the um, uh, asynchronous learning. So if you could just sort of clarify what the schedule would actually be for the virtual only model, that would be great. So that's one thing. A second thing is that one of the concerns I have with the virtual only model is, of course, that you uh, take kids away from, you, you, it's like a district approach, and so kids aren't with their um, classmates. So I wanted to emphasize the importance of kids being together with their classmates and also emphasize the importance of them being able to remain part of the school community. So being able to go to their school um, virtual assemblies, the teachers who are teaching virtually still being able to collaborate with the teachers from their home school, um, making them feel like they're still part of that school. And then the third point on that is it's really important that the um, families that opt for the virtual only model are still able to return to their um, home schools at the end of the year. I understand that mid-year that may not be possible, but by next school year, it's really important that they be that they know that there's still going to be a spot for them at their home school. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Amy Wang. Hi. Um, I just want to say thank you, um, Sandra and the CNI department for everything you've done. And um, this is a very thorough plan and very um, thoughtfully um, work through, but I want to um, echo Mrs. Pine's comments. Um, I was very concerned from hearing from the teachers from the last week's meeting about sustainability and specifically on the idea of content creation and really urge um, the, the path to think about curating um, existing content and finding ways to centralize that work so that it's not um, something that the teachers, classroom teachers need to pick up as an additional skill because that's not what they're there to do. They're there to connect with the students and really um, deepen the learning in those um, interactions with the students. Um, and I have concern that to hear from teachers that they haven't bought into the plan 
and yet they're um, the ones who have to deliver it. So that really concerns me, um, as well as consulting the parents because parents are part of this equation now um, more than even before and really need to, especially for the elementary school students, need to be the ones going over the learning plan and making sure the kids are staying on task and on that learning plan. And so I know Brian has suggested possibly involving parents or consulting parents. Um, I don't know if that's something that you would consider. Um, and my last question actually is around math and whether there's a workshop model that could be implemented in the blended um, um, delivery mechanism um, that's similar to like reader's workshop. So you can leverage um, an IST uh, model to support classroom teachers in terms of um, content creation as well as supporting students who need additional help. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Amber McDonald. Hello. <laughs> Hope everybody's having a somewhat good time throughout this, but um, I think that you guys have done a phenomenal job. Um, I know that in the spring we had a great experience at Santa Rita. Um, I did have some questions going into obviously a you know, somewhat semi full school year of looking at this. And one of them is what exactly is a sample day in the classroom going to look like? Is it going to be a lot of review and preparedness? But I know you've given general overview but like a good 8 a.m. is going to be this 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 and what that would look like so we can um, really develop kind of what our kids would be doing during those two days and then the other question I had was if you had enough kids that were going to be all virtual for one class size for one grade so if there was 18 kids could you assign a specific teacher to just be virtual with those kids so that they would have a semi same experience as we did in the spring. But otherwise, I think you guys are doing a comprehensive um, plan and I would like to take a little bit more time to, to review this and especially the health and safety precautions that will also be implemented uh, for the fall. That's all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pam Loebner. Um, hello, um, I have a couple of things I just want to mention um, very much in the line of what Roberta was talking about. Um, our youngest students, our TK students and our kindergarten students have never experienced this type of learning situation. Even if they did something like it in preschool, I've been inquiring and it was very different than what our expectations were, even with our emergency remote learning. And I'm wondering if a, a slightly different model could be considered um, perhaps, you know, getting some of the kindergarten teachers together to talk about that because I feel like if we don't get them solidly engaged in wanting to learn, it will be a very, very challenging experience for them the entire year, no matter whether we're in class or outside of class. And we have a very rigorous pace that we set in our classrooms during a normal situation that I I want us to still have rigor, but I don't know that our pace could possibly even approximate the same. Um, and it really concerns me that we, we might just alienate a lot of really terrific students. I think the social emotional component needs to come first with these younger, with these younger children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Okay. Our next speaker is Christine Cunningham. Thank you so much um, from many of us and from all of us, I echo what everyone is saying about the Herculean effort that you are all putting in. Um, I also want to remind the hundreds and hundreds of parents out there that we are not in a world of first choices right now. We are not in the world of second choices right now. And I think with the hundreds of parents with the middle school and the elementary school, we, would all, we all have different thoughts on what is right for our kid, whether we have an only child or three children or whether we work full time or not. So 
I don't disagree with a lot of the comments that have been put out this evening, but I also want parents to realize and teachers to realize that since we are not in a world of first choices, um, we, we need to do what we need to do, hopefully for the short term. And there are going to be ex an extreme number of folks who are unhappy with what the school district comes up with. And I just want you to know that there are many of us out there who do think you are continuing to do an excellent job and we'll deal with what it is, whether we like it or not, because we are in a pandemic and we, it's like I said, it's not a world of first choices. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Uh, looks like that was our last speaker. So we will move back to further board discussion follow-up questions anyone want to chime in jessica uh yeah let me find my notes for a second um actually um as it relates to um can we get an idea of the the week schedule for virtual uh learning uh sandra sure um I would say that it will probably, I have to go back, sorry, my brain is like, yeah. uh, <laughs> so I think each day I would anticipate, well, in elementary for sure, that we would, that teachers would begin their day with some type of a morning meeting and bring in that social emotional component to set the tone for the day and the expectation. Again, kind of assigning that learning plan this is the work that I want you to be working on. So there would be a combination. I know one of the speakers talked about her sense was like maybe there's two full days of synchronous learning and three full days of asynchronous. That's really not how the virtual school model would function. It would really be um, more about looking at each day and the course of the week. Each day I would anticipate that there is some asynchronous time where students are learning independently using the learning plans. And each day for a chunk of time, students would either be in a whole group meet or probably more so a series of small group meets with their teacher perhaps having completed a learning plan and then coming to a small group math session where they're processing and kind of doing those most important parts, perhaps working on a task together or looking at some student work. And then throughout that week, in addition to their core content learning plans, their synchronous time in small groups with their teacher, they would also have their specials, their, their time for PE, their time for music, um, at our junior high, that's when their, you know, electives and um, PE would happen as well at the junior high. But each day would kind of have a, a schedule, I would anticipate. Um, and then depending on that big uh, specials schedule, right, they might have music every Wednesday and Friday, or they might have an art docent lesson every single Thursday. But I would assume that our teachers would want to develop a kind of a routine and a predictable schedule because we know everybody likes a predictable schedule. Amen. Um, one other question along those lines. Um, can we somehow mix into all this the ability for them to, to vir the virtual school students to have some community with their home, uh, home school? Um, I think it, I, I do believe, uh, I can definitely stand behind that. I, I think that, yes, they'll have their, the kids in their class, but having the greater community would be helpful. Yeah, agree. And I think part of it, yes, we certainly want to keep that connection alive. Part of it will be dependent really on how many families opt their children into virtual school. I mean, we've talked uh, in some degree internally about like creating a and naming our virtual school and having a you know some community building events of our of our virtual school but it will be so dependent on if we're talking about you know 25 kids or a thousand kids and so it's kind of hard to plan for that but i certainly have heard that as a repeated want for families to maintain a connection to their to their school and um, 
we certainly want to make sure that families, while we can't guarantee, you know, after that six week mark that they might be able to reenter, we would take every effort for them to go back to their home school, but it might not be possible next year, but for that following year, absolutely, you are a Covington student or a Santa Rita student or a Springer student, and that is your spot as we get over, hopefully get over this pandemic. <laughs> Um, I think that's all I have right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? John, Vladimir? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that um, two things that have been repeated many, many times, but I'd just like to repeat them again. Um, the first one is that everyone's preferred model is 100% in-person uh, education. Yeah, back to normal, yep. Back to normal, yeah. We'll never get there, but hopefully we can get pretty close. Um, everybody wants that for a whole variety of different reasons. Um, and the second one is that um, we are prioritizing the health and welfare of our children, our parents, and our teachers. And um, it's a balancing act. Um, there are, uh, we will make mistakes along the way, in part because uh, we've never met, we've never had this sort of situation before where we have three major, um, uh, a, a confluence of three major uh, effects. We have the pandemic, of course, we have the economy that's been turned upside down, and now we have an educational model that's different from what we had before. And it's all today. We have to do it. So we are going to make mistakes, but uh, uh, I, I think that uh, we will learn from what works and what doesn't work. So um, I'd like to make a plea for uh, some tolerance here. Um, we absolutely can't please everybody. We've gotten emails that have said 100% virtual, and we've gotten emails that say 100% uh, uh, in person, and there's no middle ground there. Uh, so some tolerance would be very, very uh, appreciated. Uh, another uh, thing I'd like to make a plea for is uh, patience. Um, we can't all do it. August 16th or whatever the date we come back, we're not going to have it all done. Uh, please be patient. Uh, please be as helpful as you can. And that's probably the most important thing. Um, it's one thing to say, this is not gonna work, but if you could say this will work over here and it's not going to have a major effect over there, that would be helpful to us. At least it would be helpful to me. Um, so uh, I, I make a plea for trying to be as helpful as possible, trying to be as tolerant as possible and um, trying to be as patient as possible. So Sandra, I, you, you, I think, this is a great start. This is not an action item, by, by the way, so if I'm correct, uh, so we don't have to approve this plan. Um, but I think that you, you, you should move forward with it. Um, uh, we will change the plan over time. Uh, we will look at what works and what doesn't work. And the stuff that doesn't work, we're going to do something differently uh, as in the best way we can. Um, and uh, the stuff that is working, we're going to try to uh, get that to, to everybody. So I, I would, I would thank you. Uh, I would move ahead uh, with this. Thanks, Vladimir. Steve? It seems we're, we're starting to blend both of the comments from, from um, listeners uh, with the next item, which is more the delivery model. Uh, but my question is more about this content creation. Do you think this is going to have um, um, a longevity. So it's, I know we're going through an emergency creation plan here, but do you think we'll have it once we've got it in place, it's going to be something we can actually leverage moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah, mean, that's right. It's that was... really high quality. The, the little bits of work that I've seen as people are developing, it's, it's great quality stuff. And I can really picture it having a place in our future mm -hmm. um, for certain. Okay. That, that, that was my take, but I just want to make sure I was in sync with your thoughts on, on, you know, given the amount of work we're asking people to do to create this content, that it's not a one-off. It's going to be something that actually has legs, will be obviously edited, monitored over time. But once we've got this warehouse or library of, of content put together, we would actually be able to use it moving forward. Absolutely. Okay, that was my understanding too. Thanks. 
Okay. Um, I think Shali got dropped and is coming back. Um, so I'll just um, have a couple of things. Um, to the, the point that was made about teachers not necessarily being professional at content creators, is there, you know, would, would funding help to sort of hire them people who, who are those experts to sort of co-write lessons? Is that something you've thought about or something that It is something we can just do? recently when Randy mentioned that there is some uh, additional funding for whatever that bucket of money is. Remind me, no. Jeff, I don't remember it. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been hesitant to overcommit what I believe our team can deliver on. Um, because we are, you know, we're a small and mighty team, but as people are getting into the work, um, we really want to be able to do as much of that central creation as possible and or reach out to um, additional folks and be able to, you know, add, add to the, um, the group in some way. So yes, we're looking into ways we can explore that. So teachers don't have to feel like it's something in addition to what they're doing on a daily basis. Right, yeah, we, there's a whole bucket of money that we have to spend by the end of the year. So by the end of the calendar year. Um, so certainly it's something that I'd be interested in pursuing, whether it's over the summer or into, into the fall to take that load off teachers. Um, did you wanna address, there's we've gotten a question that's a little bit more germane to, well, it's kind of split between this item and the next item, but the question about live streaming teachers mm. as they sort of teach in their classrooms, as opposed yeah. to this model of, of sort of delivering things in two different ways. Yeah, it was one of the, um, one of the models that our think tank group looked at in, in May. Um, it was called the hybrid flex model. It came out of San Francisco State. Uh, but this idea of live, live streaming and really the bulk of our conversation was about, um, you know, you design for two different things. If you're a teacher, you're designing for in-person and just a live streaming your in-person great learning does not result in great learning for the person who's watching it. Because if I wanted to design for virtual learning, it would look totally different than how I'm going to design for my in-person learning. And while it might, um, you know, I have a teenage son who did some, some fake learning in, in springtime uh, because it, it was a lot of live streaming with zero engagement and kids need to be engaged in order to actually learn. They, they learn all sorts of ways to fake their, their engagement over hours and hours and hours of just watching somebody else actually do the learning for them. When you're not engaged, you're, not, you're using almost nothing of your brain. So it's really not the model that I would want. I believe our learning plan would result in a much better quality education for our kids on their non-in-person days, much better. And I know it's, and it does require for our primary students, it will require some support. We're putting in more of that visual graphics, the icons to help direct them and we will teach them how to navigate. But at the end of the day, um, I believe that it will result in better learning than putting kids on a computer and watching somebody else learn for four or five hours a day. And I wouldn't want our teachers designing their in-person learning for the kids on the other end of the computer either, because then we're not taking advantage of having the kids in person and neither results in great quality. Gotcha. Um, so speaking of consistent schedules and, and sort of the really young kids, like TK, kinder, maybe even the first graders, was there consideration of, you know, we used to have a half day AM PM kindergarten model. And so, some of the comments they make me wonder whether, you know, would that make more sense for the really young kids where the sort of two days in school and then, you know, five days basically not might be harder start stop dynamic. Has there been any discussion or thought about that? Yeah, we've talked. Can I, Brian, can I ask a question? Do you want sure. to go into that now? There, there's actually a slide on that in the next presentation. Okay, I can, feel free. Okay, I will, I will take my answer after the next presentation. Okay. Shall <laughs> did you have any, any questions or comments? Um, no, I'm not really sure what I missed. I got my internet kicked me off. So um, if I have any questions, I'll email them directly to Jeff and Sandra. 
Apologies. Um, okay. Uh, I think there are a few other questions that we had from um, commenters, but I think to Jeff's point, they're probably better addressed after we get the next presentation, unless any board members have further comments right now, but it doesn't look like it. Um, I do see somebody has their hands up, but since we've closed public comment on this item, I'm going to ask you to wait and be first in line for comment after we get the next presentation. So we'll move on to F2, reopening for the 2020-2021 school year. I'm not going to read this whole paragraph. Uh, Mrs. Mr. Mrs. McGonagall and Mr. Bear will present the teaching and learning portion of the draft reopening plan. All right, thank you, Marcy. Um, good evening, wanted to walk you through the, uh, the draft reopening plan for the fall. Once again, next slide. Uh, you heard a lot of this last week. We have uh, moved ahead uh, just a little bit on our timeline. Uh, the big, the big uh, piece of information we now have is that from the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, we do have the, the reopening guidelines uh, that, uh, dropped on Tuesday or Wednesday of last week. So next slide. Uh, this is a this is a key, really a key slide for or a page from the Santa Clara County Public Health Department reopening guidelines. Um, and one of the key statements that came from um, from that plan on page two, it talks about that education, just like healthcare and food provision, is an essential service in our community. And as such, the reopening of school campuses for in person instruction with strict safety protocols should be prioritized. And I couldn't agree with that more um, that we do need to prioritize uh, the reopening of our schools. Yet, as Vladimir said earlier, we need to balance that with safety and making sure we do this in a, in a manner that is safe uh, for our staff, for our students, and for our larger community. Um, the, as, as, the, as you look at this slide, um, the, the, key, the key that this slide really shows is to the left are essentially, is essentially the uh, principle of maintaining stable cohorts of students. Um, to the right, the organizing principle, as it says, is really about physical distancing and face covering. Um, and those are two, those are two different core principles um, that could exist together. But in this case, the, the county public health department has, has kind of bifurcated them. And you can see within that arrow to the left, are the younger students, to the right are the older students with a break right there between upper elementary and uh, junior high school in our case. Um, so this again really highlights that, that need. And even within the, um, if you look at the recent trailer bill language to the California state budget, uh, AB or SB 77, um, the legislature and the governor really prioritized uh, this return to in-person school, uh, recognizing that there will still be a need for uh, virtual school, that there may still be a need for partial uh, blended school, but that we should be moving on a path to reopening our schools. And so that's exactly what we're looking at doing. Um, our plan, in fact, of this continuum, as you recall, bookended with 100% virtual and 100% in-person really falls in line with what the county has released and what our state expects as well. So um, just to highlight, so there's gonna be a great deal of work uh, that happens over the next couple of weeks with regard to the, the um, health and safety and the facilities and operations guidelines, um, actually requirements that the county put out. Um, if you go to the next slide, Marcy. On a high level, um, these, are the, these are some of the big takeaways for us. 
all right, that our schools are going to only allow necessary visitors. Um, we'll be looking at drop off by car only. We won't be looking at for parking and walking up. Um, all visitors to the campus will need to wear a mask, will need to come to the office. There will be further protocols that, that are followed. If we look at our elementary schools, as I said a moment ago, really focused on that idea of stable cohorts, keeping the same children in the same class with the same teacher. Um, for those elementary school students, in this case, TK through six, um, students will wear a face covering upon arrival and departure. When they're out and about on the campus, uh, be it going to the restroom or heading out to lunch or whatever that might be, they will be required to wear face coverings. While in class, uh, the county has um, required strong encouragement to wear face coverings in the classroom where the cohorting is really focused upon. And the county is looking, is, um, looking at uh, stable seating arrangement, right? So this is all in an effort to, again, minimize exposure and minimize risk. Uh, for our junior highs, uh, they really, they have to wear face coverings at all times, right? That was, that was very straightforward. Uh, teachers, their desks need to be six feet from students and also wear face coverings at all times. And again, looking for um, that idea of stable seat arrangements for students in TK-8. One other item I'll throw in with our, with our junior high school uh, that I didn't mention there, that social distancing is the focus. Uh, really looking, uh, expecting us, requiring us to main, maintain six foot distancing in our junior high school um, classrooms. Uh, there are a number of other requirements that we are working through and over the, um, actually starting tomorrow, um, we'll be talking to our, our principal team uh, about really looking to operationalize the county plan, uh, understanding how it fits at each of our campuses, understanding the particulars at each of our campuses. Um, I liken it a little bit to like, um, perhaps flavors of ice cream, right? We're all gonna be eating ice cream, but there are gonna be different flavors at nine different campuses because they have a different number of entrances and exits. Uh, the campus setups are just a little bit different. So we're gonna to need to um, assemble teams of staff uh, to start having those conversations about how this is actually, how the particulars are actually going to be put into place on each of our nine campuses. Um, we'll need to, also then be talking to parents, communicating out to parents as well and working in concert uh, because there are going to be um, truly dozens of new expectations and protocols on our campuses. And this is really where that idea of, of safety comes in. Uh, we are gonna need to teach 4,000 students in our, almost 4,000 students in our district of varying ages as well as hundreds of staff members, uh, these, these expectations, these protocol expectations, ranging from distancing uh, in line while they're waiting for something to in-class behavior. Mask behavior is gonna be an entire, uh, an entire uh, another set of expectations to, to tackle. Um, and then as you, as you think ahead, drop off, pick up, drop off, um, there are going to be expectations there as well, not to mention lunch, recess, uh, the list really goes on and on. And um, we are going to need to have parents without fail submit symptom checks uh, so that we can ensure, and our employees as well, so we can ensure everyone stepping onto that campus is as safe as possible. So um, this is that, that uh, call for uh, a a, um, a thoughtful implementation of this new order uh, on our campuses. So as we move ahead, Sandra, you have the next one. Yep. So we want to just remind you that um, you know the plan we're presenting tonight 
is really along that continuum and we do believe that our plan falls right in line with the guidelines that the county has put out. Um, if you can go to the next slide and it's important to note that while we are um, recommending we start in a blended model that we're really prepared as as the circumstances change to start anywhere within that continuum. Next slide. I thought you would really want to know how did we get here um, and kind of the process we went through. And so I wanted to share that with you today. Um, throughout the month of May or setting up in April and then throughout the month of May, we had a think tank of teachers and administrators from schools all across the district, all nine schools variety of grade levels and specialty positions. Um, but we reviewed so many <laughs> different uh, articles and what was happening internationally during that time in May of as schools were returning from around the world and or still in their blended learning or virtual learning mode. Um, we, I met with this group three times a week from the beginning of May until the end of May. So I was spending my Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays with some or all of, of the folks who um, joined us in our think tank to talk through each of, we started with seven scenarios and then um, somebody suggested an eighth scenario, which we brought in at the end there. So just taking time, thinking through the implications for our primary students, our upper grade students, our English learners, our students in uh, special education, and what would each scenario kind of uh, look like for, for those different groups of students and for our teachers and for our families. We had a group who uh, kind of became an offshoot of this group as our social emotional learning team and they did um, study kind of outside of the group and then came back to report to the group on kind of the needs and impacts of how do we need to be prepared to meet the needs of our students and staff and their social and emotional health and their mental health. So we had a group doing that work and that work continues throughout the summer as well. Um, and in the end, as we made our way towards the end of May, we really ended up <laughs> taking bits and pieces from almost every single scenario except for number eight um, uh, to really arrive at what is now termed was not at the time but this idea of an instructional continuum um, Jeff and I met with the LATA leadership to talk about kind of the framework of what we were thinking, looking at some teacher schedules and student schedules for both a blended and a virtual model. Um, we also reached out to, uh, I reached out as did uh, Raquel Mataroli, one of our principals, uh, a, a group of parents over meet to just understand their feedback, their questions, how might this plan work for their family, what have we forgotten to consider um, to make sure that we did hear from parent voices and hopefully those who were a part of those different focus group meetings actually see some changes that were or tweaks that were made based on that feedback. Um, and ultimately I, you know, where we landed with this concept of the continuum with the recommendation of starting um, in a blended model and really prioritizing our youngest learners and our and our least independent learners to come back as we can get closer and closer to that 100 percent in person um, next slide uh, we, you just heard a lot about learning plans, but we wanted to make sure that you remember that, you know, that learning plan is going to be that central um, constant for kids throughout the continuum, whether they participate in the 100% virtual school option or whether we have to move to 100% virtual school because of the circumstance um, that it works in the blended model and can even support in the fully 100% in-person model. But it's really that um, driving force of continuity throughout the entire um, continuum. Next slide. So we are, I don't remember, Jeff, where you're um, taking up or where I am, but... Um, You've got a couple more. Okay. Uh, so in the blended model is where we're recommending, and I think Jeff just talked about that before. It really allows us to um, 
to fulfill the ask of the county of getting schools back and but being really mindful of the safety of our staff of our students within our community to make sure that we have time to practice and put into place all of those new protocols that we need to put in place and to work out the kinks as we get closer to the 100 percent in person and we do that in some kind of measured way um, next slide and just a reminder what that blended model looks like. So we are recommending that our students start with a two days in person with three days of online learning in that A and B rotation. Um, this will be at their home school um, for those in-person learning days and that our teachers are bringing back with hopefully a lots of central support that comprehensive curriculum that was missing in the springtime um, and that we're bringing back our good practices for learning around making sure that kids are attending school, that they're doing the work and engaging in the work that is so important to their growth and that we are going back to our mastery rubric grading so we can be providing feedback to, to students and to their families on what their academic progress looks like. Next slide. So I, so I mentioned um, just a, a few minutes ago, we, we, we are looking toward this 100% this opportunity of having kids back in person, but we know we have to proceed with some caution as well, right? Um, balancing that idea of staff and student health and safety, which is paramount in a pandemic, with this want and... Um, uh, direction of going back to all students on campus. Um, ensuring that we, we've said it a couple of times, ensuring that we have the right protocols in place, that we are following um, the, the expectations from the public health officer, not just because they are the the law of the land and the expectations, but because we know that they are critical to keep all of us safe and healthy. Um, so that that's, and I, th I think as we see um, examples um, around us near and far, uh, we know that um, uh, kind of that idea of opening this too quickly without having all of these measures in place could cause us to um, have to take action the other way and, and close up more qu quickly than we want to. We would prefer taking a little bit more time at the front end, ensuring we have everything in place necessary for a, um, a sustained opening um, as, we, as we move forward. So next slide. Um, and th this is a, this is a, a question I pose to the board, and Brian, I'll let you um, decide here whether you want to uh, take some responses here or wait uh, from the board. But I, I would the, the question is posed: What is our safe path to getting to that county goal of in person for TK six? Right, um, we're talking about starting at roughly fifty percent. Um, but what's the what's the cadence, um, and what what are the what are the checkpoints we want to make sure we hit? Um, I'd like to understand what the board is is thinking about, um, and then we're happy to to um, take some direction and and come back with perhaps a um, a couple of ideas or some thoughts on on that. So, um, yeah, why don't you go through? I think you've only got a couple of slides left. Yep. Um, so okay. why don't we do those and then we'll we'll wrap it up and uh, okay move on to questions. So next slide. Um, just a bit about communications. Uh, I want the board and and the, our community to know we are putting together a reopening section on our web page um, as we move forward. It'll contain uh, all of this information, um, some FAQs, and then. Um, places to contact us for additional questions. We'll also be looking for continued 
uh, communications from me, the board, uh, at the local site, the principals, um, just keeping parents up to date, staff up to date on what is, uh, what's happening as we move forward. We're uh, just about 40, 44 days or so till the open of school. Um, so we are conscious of the fact that communicating this early uh, and getting parents as well as staff prepared uh, with some early information about what they can expect when they come back to school. So perhaps they can start prepping now uh, in mid-July through August to have their children and have our staff as prepared as possible. Um, also developing some informational videos as well as uh, postings for around campuses and um, the district. So next slide. Um, what's next? Uh, tonight, we're hoping that we can move down the road to uh, finalize the instructional plan. I think, again, Sandra has said it, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, the plan is really a continuum of um, situations, right, that we think we will be moving in and out of during the course of the year. I think it's really important we think of this as a continuum. What we're talking about is starting at a particular point in that continuum, but knowing that we're more than a month out, that could change as well um, between now and then. But this idea that we're gonna move back, we have the potential to move back and forth is what's really critical. Some districts are calling them phases, some are calling them stages. We just landed on the continuum. Um, we also this week, we want to send out information on this instructional plan to families, um, looking for that option to opt in to 100% virtual. Um, we'll begin gathering that information. As I said earlier, um, this week is when we'll begin partnering with individual school staff, school sites and staffs um, regarding um, the health and safety and the implementation of all of this work as we look ahead to August 19. Um, we'll come back to you again in three weeks on July 27 uh, with the full health and operations plan. We anticipate having that a bit earlier, so it will be uh, circulating for some input um, within our community, within our, uh, within our staffs, uh, with our principals. Uh, early August, um, we will come back with uh, some more detail around technology and information on the specific school sites, the nine of them. And then uh, there it is, August 19th, the first day of school um, for 2021. I think we have one more slide, Marcy. So um, thinking about tonight, um, the instructional plan, uh, looking for the, the go ahead on that, on that idea of a, continue of a continuum of instruction. Um, recognizing three instructional modes, uh, recognizing there's a virtual option for families and really looking for that uh, flexibility through that continuum to uh, flex and comply with any, any changes uh, or any shifts that might happen because of health situations in the county. Um, and then the second is really that, um, that looking on that, out on that horizon for our elementary schools, TK6, um, uh, looking for the board to discuss uh, factors they might want to consider for bringing additional students back on campus. Um, how long that might be, we, we will consult our health staff as well uh, for guidance there. We'll also check with, with County Health uh, on this as well. And we have some great resources in our parent community too with, uh, with international knowledge on these topics that we can tap into also. Um, and again, uh, continuing to maintain a virtual option as long as we need, um, as long as public health allows uh, for that. So with that, Brian, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we will take uh, questions from board members uh, before we move on to public comment. So who would like to start? Jessica. Hi there. All right, I have a, a couple questions um, I saved from not bringing up during your learning plan. Uh, <laughs> um, 
So you covered actually one of the questions I had here. Let me see the next one. What were um, the uh, eight other scenarios you considered? Mm, yeah, I brought my notes because I always forget uh, the <laughs> crazy titles that we invented or I invented for them. So the first one we looked at was um, called the intensives model, and it really focused on bringing back only certain students. So it really focused on bringing back our TK2 students mm -hmm. and our seventh grade students um, as they transition to junior high and having the other grade levels do 100% virtual. So oh. that was the first model we looked at. Uh, the second one was this one known as targeted curriculum where uh, students would have certain curriculum in person and certain curriculum taught virtually. So targeting depending on um, what the curriculum is. Uh, split curriculum was the third one, this idea of um, there being an option for families to do either whatever our model was going to be or a fully virtual model, but having that option for families was really the, um, the split curriculum model. There was a block plan where um, rotating content, so as we're doing in the junior high, this idea of like a science or social studies block. Um, so as to not overwhelm students with too much content at one time. Um, we looked at that hybrid flex model, kind of the live streaming of in-person classes. Um, we looked at one called remote tutorial, where it um, really brings in those expert teachers who help create videos and or design learning plans. So, um, so not every teacher has to do their own all the time. Um, fully remote, 100% remote as being our, our choice was the seventh one. And then probably a week or two in, somebody brought up the idea of looping. Um, two of our teachers on, the, on our team, on our think tank group, had actually had looping experiences. And looping is when the teacher moves with the class from one grade to, a, to the next and the class and the teacher remain intact. So it was interesting to hear their experiences on looping and what have you. But those were the eight different models we looked at. Okay. In a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you actually brought it up before um, in the prior conversation. It, it, it seemed like you tried to take the best in breed from all, all seven um, to get where we got. Yeah, we really did. All right, um, my next question is, how did we um, end up with, uh, for, your, for the blended model, the Monday, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, Friday uh, split? Yeah, I would say we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at an, an AM, PM. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at a Monday, oh boy, my Monday, Thursday, Thursday. Tuesday, Friday. Uh, we looked at very briefly at a week on, a week off. Um, and, you know, I think the, the kind of final decision point for this one was with our principal group um, and just really thinking through, and we talked about it in our think tank as well, like what, what cadence makes the most sense. Um, and just this idea of having, I don't think anybody liked the idea of a week on and a week off. Um, they felt like that would be challenging for continuity, but this idea of uh, having two consecutive days seemed to resonate more than any of the other models. I know there was concern with the AMPM just around uh, the procedures and the cleaning and the pickup and the drop off and all of those things that would have to happen on any one day and the just the daily contacts for for the our staff working with students. Um, so I, I think we landed on the best the best version. Yeah, I I like it. Um, what is my next thing. Um, so who um, who who will be teaching the virtual school? We're, I, I, I don't believe we're hiring anything, anybody else. Is it, how, who, who will be teaching? Our LASD teachers will be teaching virtual school. And it's uh, one of the moms said, 
Um, you know, if a certain number of kids, like within a grade level band, uh, opt to go virtual, yes, it seems ideal that that, that that teacher would become the virtual teacher for that group. And I, it's hard to predict how clean it's going to be. Um, so it's, it's really unknown right now until we get that kind of opt-in data back from our families of exactly in an ideal world, you know, we have three real third grade classes and we have just enough for one to be virtual <laughs> and that teacher becomes the virtual teacher. I mean, that's the ideal model, but we'll have to see how it, um, how it really plays out. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess I just want to, I guess more for Jeff. Um, what are our really our our plans right now for health and, and, and safety? I know that we have the plans coming to us at the end of of the month, but like what what do you foresee in those plans? Yeah. So um, with, without the exact particulars, I think. Uh, we, we will expect to see uh, limited access to the campus other than staff or uh, students. Mm -hmm. um, I think we will see uh, uh, the requirement to uh, provide symptom checks uh, on all people who are entering campus. Um, I think you'll see, I talked about the masks earlier and the, the, the mask requirements. Um, on the elementary campuses, anytime outside the classroom, um, six foot distancing. Um, that'll be that'll be lining up for the you know to wash your hands, to the bathroom, to you know wherever we're going. Um, six foot distancing on the junior high school campus. Um, we'll see that in the classroom as well. Um, that six foot distancing. Um, as we talked about earlier, the elementary campuses are really focusing on. Um, the health orders are really focusing on stable cohorts so that you may have um, less than six foot distancing in elementary grade classrooms, uh, whereas in the junior high school classroom, six feet are, is going to be uh, required uh, at all times. Um, um, we're, we're working on protocols for frequency of hand washing. Um, what we're going to expect from students and when we're going to expect from students and staff uh, hand washing, uh, not just before and after lunch, but at, at various times uh, during the day. Um, working with um, maintenance and operations on classroom cleaning uh, and, and uh, disinfecting, sanitizing. Uh, we are uh, coming up to speed quite quickly on the differences between cleaning and disinfecting and sanitizing and which we are doing when and how frequently and paying attention to high touch surfaces like doorknobs and uh, drinking fountains, uh, sinks, things like that. And knowing that those need to be cleaned more frequently, looking at the transitions between um, classes, right? As group, group A is uh, being replaced by group B, uh, the level of cleaning that needs to be, take place in classrooms uh, during those times, uh, we look at more public spaces uh, like school offices and um, uh, look at the, the protections and precautions that are going to have to uh, be in place there uh, in terms of uh, screening and so forth, some kind of uh, dividers that we're going to have to have in place at all school offices. Um, we're looking at lunch protocols. Um, that's going to change. Um, I think of some of our schools where all the primary kids, you know, eat in one big uh, kind of mass um, because it makes supervision that much easier. That's going to have to change. Uh, we're going to have to have kids eating in different sections of the campus uh, with greater distance, and it is going to require greater supervision. So we have to work through all of that as well. Uh, same goes for recess, uh, understanding the distancing that's gonna to need to be there, the staggering that's gonna to have to take place. Um, probably not gonna have 500 children out at recess at one time. Um, that's gonna look uh, a whole lot different. Um, I think it's gonna take a, a little while to get used to um, for kids and for, for adults as well. Uh, we have to look at other common spaces on campus like STEM labs and libraries and multi-purpose rooms. Um, 
I think assemblies are going to be paused for, for a while. Field trips um, probably going to be paused for a while. Um, and then there's drop off and pick up, right? Which, um, which is a very complicated time uh, under normal circumstances. And now we need to um, work through processes uh, for drop off and pick up at all nine of our campuses mm -hmm. and um, understand whether they need to be staggering and kids who don't arrive on time and what if someone you know hasn't done a symptom check and th there's there are a myriad of uh, protocols that we are working through and personalizing for each campus, but all in the name of making sure we're able to reopen yeah. and making sure we can keep our, our students and, and staff safe, right? Looking at the, uh, um, looking at the, the, the numbers, right? Of, and the, the frequency of contracting the disease in, in children versus adults. Um, we, we really need to make sure that we're taking every measure possible to keep our people safe. Um, our teachers are our lifeblood. They're what make our schools go. And um, if we don't have them, it's, it's gonna be really difficult. So uh, they want to come back, they want to teach their kids, uh, but they wanna be safe. And we have to respect that and figure out how we create that balance and make sure we take care of them. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. That was uh, yep. that was a very good first plan. <laughs> now you just need all the little details um, on it. And I just want to emphasize, I, you know, I'm asking all these questions just to make sure I know how we got here on and yep. where we're going. Um, I am really amazed with all the work uh, that's been done uh, so far um, and that you guys continue to do. So thank you um, very much. I think that is it for now for my questions. Thank you. Sandra, do you want to say a little bit about, I know um, we had talked about it earlier, just the AB and just getting into that a little bit, how we want to make sure there's some consistency for families, but um, you know, how we're going to handle yeah, absolutely. Those that I, don't fit kind right. of thing. I know that this has come up a little bit, right? We need to do um, uh, master scheduling, which is really exciting. So how do we uh, kind of systematically break students into an AB rotation, uh, trying to be mindful that we want heterogeneous groupings uh, as much as humanly possible and uh, I, you know, I know every spring our teachers go to great lengths to build their perfect next year's classroom and then we throw a pandemic at them. So uh, we'll see how it works, but we're really looking at a, um, an alphabet kind of cut, whatever that might be. So whether it's A through L, M through Z, we have to kind of look at the numbers and look school by school, but we are really looking to keep siblings together on that same grouping. Um, you know, some of our families have students at, at multiple sites or in multiple grade levels. Um, and I would just say if there's an outlier need there that we, we want to take care of families to make sure that that it's going to be workable for them. Um, but, but probably some alphabet, and I know people want to do their planning. That'll be something that we push out to our school site sooner rather than later to start working on the kind of those numbers and configurations so families can get a sense of what their schedule is going to be. Um, actually, along those lines, is that something that we've thought about including in the sort of information and survey that we're sending out in the next week or two about families opting 100% virtual or not, whether at the same time we should be asking whether they have a strong preference between the Monday, Tuesday versus the Thursday, Friday. Um, Cause I know I've heard that already from a couple of parents and also um, whether they're trying to coordinate this with the high school as well. I mean, not necessarily promising that we would offer them their choice of those things, but just to sort of start to get a sense of what the preferences are. We talked about that. Where did we land, Sandra? I, I we thought we were going to do what you described and um, come up with a break and then let people recognize that people will need to shift. Right. 
I think sometimes I remember part of our conversation was the a little bit of fear of asking people kind of what they even though we can't guarantee something when people make a preference and then for whatever scheduling reason we're unable to honor it that they it doesn't feel good <laughs> as opposed to working from the other end like here's where you ended up and how might this work for you sure i mean I, so I, I understand that dynamic and i i totally remember that dynamic back in the am pm kindergarten days um at the same time this is such a difficult situation for everybody um i, I wonder if you know something that ends up with somewhat suboptimal class construction just might sort of have to give way in the face of you know families trying to make this unprecedented structure work at all so it's just something to think about i think yeah and as as sandra said we are absolutely committed to shifting and making it work and and you know cajoling um knowing that someone who is assigned a b may need or a may need b right and right sure okay uh, sorry i interrupted somebody i think no uh other questions Chitali. okay thank you um i just have one question because i think most of my questions have been answered between our last board meeting and this one but my question is can a student move seamlessly between the blended model and the birch and the hundred percent virtual model for example if they have to quarantine right what happens then like do we have a plan for what happens then well i think it's so in that particular scenario if i'm understanding that correctly shally it's that that, that family has not opted into the 100 percent virtual right sorry they're right. living their blended world and for whatever reason a student has to quarantine uh, for two weeks. So their learning plan would continue right along, right? We'd have to figure out some central supports to, to uh, make sure that they're transitioning quickly. But I think that student would probably end up uh, looking at the virtual meets daily for both of their groups, their A groups and their B groups. So they had that kind of contact with their teacher and we would need to figure out what additional supports we would need to put in place to make sure that for their two weeks that they're maintaining um, their progress and then they're ready to re-enter. But while if they are well enough, while they're at home, they're able to do the same work that their classroom peers are doing and engage in the same conversations that they're having. Thank you. That, that definitely sounds very seamless yeah. to me. And I think, um, like, I think that I've maybe, I think that maybe families don't understand that whether you opt into 100% virtual or the blended model, it's still the same curriculum. It's still the same learning plans. Like, everything is still the same. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Vladimir? Um, just a, a, a detailed question. Um, are, are, will students be allowed to arrive at school on bicycles? Or have you not decided? That's fine to say we haven't decided. I hadn't thought about that detail yet, but I'm assuming that's a yes. I would okay. assume so too. What's that? I, would I, I think it's a yes. Okay. They will. Okay. Um, uh, the, the other comment is just a comment that I think our, uh, our plans or your plans that you've outlined are for TK5 or TK6 are fairly uh, uh, complete, but for 7, 8, for the middle schools, there's a lot more um, unknowns, if you want, in there. And um, we'll have to sort of work that out, I think. Um, like, do you clean the rooms every day? Do you disinfect the rooms every day? Do you sanitize the rooms every day? That kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, you had asked earlier about um, what we think the sort of like the steps um, would, um, along the way. I personally don't think we could go to 100% in person unless there's a vaccine out there. 
Um, I, I just can't, I, I don't think we're gonna achieve herd immunity ever. <laughs> Um, so I think vaccines are going to be necessary for us to go to that thing. And because of that, um, we have to remain flexible in whatever we do. And I think you've, you've said that, uh, so that that's a good thing. I'll just point out that the county health orders say we can. Go to a hundred percent. Yep. Um, well, for, for certain student cohorts, right? For the, for particular the, grade level students, elementary students. Um, okay. <laughs> Mine is well, well, let's, let's keep this, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we're trying to do questions before we get to public comment. So let's circle back around to this discussion later in the meeting. Sorry to cut people off. Steve. So I just had one comment and I think it's more around the idea of cohorts and, and Vladimir touched on one of my my thoughts too is walking, walking and biking to school means we need to train the kids. They can only come with their cohort. They can't come with the usual buddy if they're not in their classroom. Um, it means class uh, um, families, if they're trying to figure out daycare post, need to do it within their cohort. They can't do it with random groupings. So that thought process, and the more we can make that clearer to people up front, Cohort is king in, in what we're trying to achieve here. And so that um, in drop off pickup in after school activities, that has to be a collaborative process that once we have a cohort established, we need that maintained everywhere for a while. And so that thought process needs to be one that we in, ingrain in, the, in our messaging to, to families in our discussions about this all the time is that cohort becomes the most important thing of what we're trying to do, unfortunately. Um, delivery of education, obviously very important, but this cohort for safety for our staff, for our children, it becomes something that we really have to embrace and understand we're gonna have to keep, live with for a while. And I just wanna make sure that doesn't get lost in this conversation with people. Okay, um, I just have a couple of questions before we go to, to public comment. Um, as I understand it, the to Steve's point about cohorts um, and some of the slides about not having any sort of extraneous people on campus, I just wanna make sure. So uh, the plan is basically that all of the adults who are on a particular campus will only ever be on that campus. Is that sort of a fair statement? So in the past, we've had various traveling math teachers, nurses, that kind of thing. My, I believe that the plan is to not have that dynamic this year. Right, I think, that, I think that's the rule, right? right. I think. If there's some strange situation, there may be an exception to that rule, but that's generally speaking, that is the rule. Right, okay. Um, and then did I hear this right? Um, you're saying that sort of the, as we operationalize the plan going forward, parents, should parents look to their principals to sort of get those details on a campus by campus basis? Is that kind of the next layer or is that? Yeah, I, th I think we'll still communicate the, the high level, but we will begin folding into um, uh, being able to communicate that school specific, school specific information, right? Because that is, uh, that, that's critical to parents, right? To understand what's happening at their school site and what it means for them and their kids. So yes, that's, that's that next level that I think will start coming toward mid end of July. Right. And is that about the same time that parents will, will parents be able to see that before they have to pick in-person versus virtual or is that kind of the same time frame, or do you have a sense of that I yet? see what, just sort of see what the details, as, as you said, sort of both conditions in the county are changing, but I've heard from some parents who also want to get as much detail as they can about what blended learning will look like on their particular campus before they make that final decision about whether they want to do the on-person blended learning versus opt for the 100% virtual. And I understand there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem there because teachers are gonna get assigned based on the numbers and so that'll feed into the thing. Yep. So I just wanna sort of- Yeah, I think, we're of, gonna, I think we're gonna have to put it out and get our best- um, Estimate. Our, our best estimate or approximation and then continue to morph it a bit as, 
you know, people, you know, we, we may have families that are, you know, kind of in the, in the undecided category, right. Or they're not sure yet. Um, and I expect that to be true. And I think people up to the end may, may right. say, wait a minute, I want to change my mind. And yeah, that may happen. And we'll, we will do our best to adjust. I'm confident we can do that. This is a pretty um, pliable thing right now. So. Okay. Um, Brian, I'm, I'm just thinking the, the okay. one you talked about people moving from campus to campus, the one um, exception we're still waiting on, um, we're still waiting on some guidance in special education mm -hmm. regarding certain specialists, uh, occupational therapists, behaviorists, those sorts of things. So we will, we'll find out about those as soon as we hear about the guidance. Jessica, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, it's a follow-up to that, uh, to your question slash his uh, addition. What about substitute teachers? Right, that's, uh, that is something we're working through too. We know we're gonna need to have substitute teachers available. Um, yes. And that will be a change to a cohort, yes. And some of this, I mean, the, the you didn't touch on it directly, Jeff, but the the county has said they the released the guidelines, which I think we attached to the, the agenda, but they've said there's half a dozen or more sort of supplemental guidelines coming around after school care and I'm sure substitute Special and, ed, and all the rest of this stuff. So, you know, we, we're not going to get for everybody watching. We're not going to get to make all of these decisions. Some of them are going to be dictated by by the county. Um, they haven't even put out their sort of FAQ follow up to their initial guidelines yet. So Right. And uh, much like we're having to lot. wait here, Brian, um, we're having to wait on the other end as well for for some right. information coming coming down from above with the county. Um, and so, so sorry, Planner, if I can ask one more thing. Um, sort of do we have a sense looking at the this is a little bit down in the weeds, but looking at the junior high plan um, and the discussion of doing an elective wheel. Um, that makes sense for a lot of the electives, but it occurred to me to wonder what about language and music, which are sort of two of the sort of full year uh, things that we certainly don't want to lose from our offering, but are a little bit different. Different. Yeah, I uh, seventh graders who wanted to opt into language or music would it would need to be a, an additional virtual course for them, right? Um, the county guidelines were very specific around certain music, no in-person choral singing, no woodwind instruments. Um, so, so both language and music would be taught virtually as an additional course to the elective wheel. Okay. Sorry, Vladimir, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, it's, it's fine. Um, Jeff, uh, from what you were talking or, uh, about, it seems that we uh, would allow parents to make decisions about whether they wanted to participate in the virtual vir in the blended versus virtual model based upon um, factors that are not health related. Is that true? I believe we will let them well they're they're going to be health related because they're going to have some concern about the the disease is my assumption okay um all right yeah i guess you're right uh but it just uh it seemed to me that 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 what you were allowing was uh perhaps a bit more freedom than i had expected that's all uh, okay uh I, I i'm not sure i can articulate exactly what the distinction is and as you pointed out they're all related to health in some way um but i i uh, i guess i i would be more comfortable if we had um really you have to have a uh, articulate a good health reason for for opting for 100 percent virtual okay um brian can i just add one thing um absolutely it just made me, when, when Sander was speaking earlier, it made me think of um, this, and that is, uh, you know, that there, there is so much information being learned constantly about um, this disease, right? And I think about from 
when school was ordered closed in person um, back on March 13th of this year. And we moved into a, an emergency remote teaching situation. We were closed because there was a there was a, a an approaching pandemic, and we weren't sure how to deal with it, how it behaves, um, any of those things. Um, and our health officer, you know, made the decision to close it. So now we're we're uh, four months later, almost, and there's been learning about this. Um, uh, disease. And so the, the, the health orders have come down um, last week with some very tangible actions that we can take to reduce the risk substantially from contracting this, right? That, that's kind of it in a simplified um, statement. So, um, I, I bring this up because, you know, as Sandra said, they, we, we consulted other countries um, and examples of what they're doing. Um, we have read about other states, uh, the approaches they've taken, what we've learned about um, schools and, and their approach and its effectiveness or not non-effectiveness. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, we are charged with following the orders of the health officer in Santa Clara County. And, you know, their work too is influenced by what's going on in the world. But um, we, we, cause I get questions all the time but we don't get to make individual decisions, right? We have to make decisions that are within the gui uh, guidelines set up by, by the county. So I just think it's just because I, it's important to bring up and I think it's important for, for people to know because you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics sends out a report or, you know, some research firm sends out a report and that's helpful, but ultimately it doesn't legally drive what we're able to do, um, and even if we wanted to. That's it. Okay. Um, well said, uh, we will go now to public comments. Um, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it's your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure that your microphone is on. And I think we will give each speaker two minutes, please, Marcy. Our first speaker is Gina Osberg. Hi, so I have taught eighth grade science at Egan for 10 years. Um, obviously, I would love to rewind and go back to begin my year as I did last year, but we know it's not possible. So last spring, we had to quickly adapt to virtual learning, and being a scientist, I surveyed my kids on my need, their needs. You know, they're eighth graders. They can tell me what they want, what they appreciate, and one thing that was very apparent through data um, was how much they gained, appreciated, and valued live interaction on a daily basis. I was able to teach live lessons, offer optional office hours, interact with students via email and message boards, and offer small group intervention when needed. You know, I was truly available to all my students every single day. And it wasn't easy, but it was manageable. You know, I am deeply concerned that that is not possible in the current blended model that we're looking at. If I am live teaching small groups four days a week, then I am not available to any student that's doing virtual learning those days or the kids are 100% virtual learning. I can't be answering emails while I'm instructing and supervising another group of kids. Um, I think the Wednesday time is also unclear to me. You know, we've been said it's for planning, but we're also said it's for when we're meeting with kids or doing small group work. Uh, I think the afternoon meet on the middle school side is confusing as well because those kids have four teachers that they need to sign that day or there would be virtual learning that day that they need to meet with. You know, it's unclear when we will actually get time to virtually meet with our students. Um, you know, I'm a parent as well. I have kids in a different district, so I've seen Maybe we lost you there, Gina. 12, 18 for my students um, versus five days of me being available all day to help, assist, teach, and answer questions. You know, it's really a no contest to me of how I can truly support those students. Thank you. 
Next speaker. Our next speaker is David Sobel. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And I, I want to thank all of you for all the time that you've put into thinking through these plans and working through the myriad number of complexities that I imagine no educator really thought they needed to consider. Um, I don't envy the task that, that, uh, and the problem that you guys all need to solve. Um, that said, I want to ask about, about contingency planning. Like you've talked about this being a continuum with the goal of getting to 100% in-person learning. Um, we haven't heard very much about sort of downside risk management, how the process might look if health conditions change that require a shift away from 100% towards more virtual. We haven't heard about uh, protocols within the school community of how to manage individual classrooms, how to manage individual students, how to manage the, 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 the whole school. Inevitably, people will get sick. It might be COVID, it might be the, a, a runny nose. And I think that, um, I think what Steve said, talking about how parents really need to be part of this community and part of the solution, like in terms of having this sustained opening, um, parents really are a vital piece in this puzzle. You're going to need to clearly communicate um, rules and, and get people to understand what the expectations are and the protocols are for when things don't necessarily go in the best direction. So I really want to urge you to start that parent education piece as soon as possible and really walk through all the possibilities of what may happen in this sort of roller coaster ride towards the 100% goal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Mariana Naberniak. Hello, this is Mariana. Go ahead, Mariana. Go ahead. Hello, um, I just have a quick question on the cohorts. Do we already have a target week when those cohorts are gonna be announced so we can plan and um, a pass uh, to race, let's say we want exception or this doesn't work for us, who do we ask? That's it, thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Our next speaker is Anand Rangathanen. Hi, um, I have a few questions and my hope is that before, certainly before uh, parents have to make a decision, um, they know the answers to all of these questions. Um, and certainly I, I was hoping that some of these would already be addressed before the board has to vote on it. Um, you mentioned that STEM and art and so on are going to be remote. How are the students going to get supplies for all of these things? Are we going to, is the district going to go around handing them out to all the, all the students? Um, I, I know the speaker spoke about some of the videos are going to be pre-made in a very professional format and so on. Um, one of the great things we had um, during the spring was we were able to go back and forth with the teacher. One of our, one of our children has, um, you know, needs very has very specific needs around his uh, vision disability, and and they were able to customize the way they were making the videos for him. If you're going to pre-make all these videos, that's going to go out of the window, and you're just going to have videos that are probably going to be useless for 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 our child. And then, what are you going to do about that? And the other problem I have is, uh, as a previous speaker mentioned, what is the protocol going to be if let's say one student falls sick? I have not seen anything here about what, what happens to the blended, what happens to the in-school, what happens if two children fall sick, what happens if four children fall sick. Um, and finally, what does recess look like? What does the playground look like? Will, will, will the students be forced, you know, not to touch any of the equipment? Um, so I guess before we parents have to make decisions, we should know what is our, the kid's life in school going to look like? 
not just from an instructional perspective, but from an entire, you know, the whole day perspective. We need to know what would happen if something went wrong, like someone fell sick. And finally, we need to know what does the virtual, the online look like for things that are not obviously, um, you know, um, obviously just writing in math. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Shira Aero. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you again. I just want to echo um, the gratitude for all of the work that you guys are doing. I have a slew of questions and comments. Um, the first is perta pertaining to sixth grade. So for most districts, sixth grade falls into middle school. My question is, will we apply the same requirements of the masks and social distancing for our sixth graders, even though they're in elementary school, usually they're in middle school. So I would ask that you make serious consideration of that. Also, when Sandra talked about the learning plan, I noticed on the slide it was for TK through five and um, there was mention of the eighth grade. I just wonder, I didn't mention how sixth grade curriculum is being covered and I would like to better understand that. Um, I wanna echo the concern with giving approval to the learning plan plan, uh, given what I heard to be as concerns that were raised by teachers and parents. I was not on last week's call, but just from a change management standpoint, right, when we're asking teachers who are key stakeholders to implement something, if there are still concerns, I have concerns with adopting something without fully addressing those concerns. But I wanna also acknowledge that I get that time is critical because we have to get things out quickly so you guys have time to better plan and communicate. Uh, my third uh, point is if a family changes their comfort with their child going to school in person or you know, in that hybrid model, will they be able to move to virtual? So I know that that was raised by Vishali in terms of what if a child has to be quarantined. This is a little bit different. If a family's comfort level changes, could they make that shift? And then what would the transition look like and how would the child be supported? How would they be made to feel comfortable in the virtual classroom? Um, and then for safety measures, I'm wondering if you guys have evaluated the ventilation system. I didn't hear mention of that to see if it's at the level that's needed. And then from a teacher safety standpoint, I am happy to hear that you guys are recommending that all kids wear masks. Um, definitely prefer to be safer rather than sorry, since there's still a lot of unknown about this COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you, next speaker. Our next speaker is Marjorie Handel. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I know that it's been, you know, I appreciate all the work that's going into this is this is not easy. Um, it's a constantly changing environment and we're trying to adjust and do the and do the best we can. Again, not ideal. We're kind of having to go with our third or fourth or fifth option. But my biggest concern is basically around the learning model with um, students only getting a couple hours of in-person instruction three days a week um, other, th other than the two days they go to school. Um, and with that mechanism, I guess what I want to know is what's in place to make sure that students are actually engaged for those three days and not getting frustrated by the lack of assistance when they are trying to complete assignments or they're choosing just to rush through the assignments just so they can get on to watching more TV or playing other games because their parents are working. I don't have time to sit with my son for six hours a day to make sure he's actually putting his best work, work forward. Um, and if the teachers are only checking the larger assignments and not checking in every day to check understanding, then when they get the larger assignments, I'm, last year I was seeing a lot of frustration with my son because he, he didn't understand what he needed to do. And asking a third grader to type into a chat window with his teacher to explain something he doesn't understand or to communicate what he doesn't understand is not really reasonable. And so that really is my concern is how are we gonna make sure that our children are staying engaged for a full school day and that there is assistance when they're completing the assignments, that they don't have to just wait until that one two hour window to try to get the teacher's attention. Um, in addition, um, actually that was it. So those are my comments. Again, I know it's really hard. There's no quick answer. Um, I appreciate you guys working on this. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Amber McDonald. Hello, um, so I have a few questions mainly just around um, safety. So one of them being, has there been any sort of consideration to move all or a majority of the in-person class um, outside? 
That way it protects everyone, um, including the teachers. And then second of all, <laughs> I think we've seen mostly in society that by making a recommendation to wear a mask, it's usually not followed. So you're gonna put teachers um, in a bad position if they are then requiring their classes to wear masks. I think that it should be maybe not kinder, but um, you know anybody that first grade and up um, that can sustain wearing a mask, maybe you have to take breaks outside and things like that, but it has been shown that the indoor spread um, increases significantly when people are unmasked. Um, so I would just like to see both of those things considered. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next Our speaker next is Sarah Smith. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you, of course, for all the hard work and commitment to uh, providing the best possible education for our kids, um, even in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and thank you so much, Jessica, for asking such relevant questions that are uh, on the forefront of the minds of, of many parents. Um, I had a couple questions specifically to the in-person learning and the statement that Sandra made about not wanting to design it for remote learning because of a lack of engagement. But I was just wondering um, about the social distancing rules. What does that look like and why it doesn't translate to um, in-home learning? A second point I wanted to make was um, as a frontline worker at our county hospital, I am anticipating a high likelihood of frequent quarantines for the, the cohorts in the blended model. Um, and I really worry about reality not meeting the expectations as stated in this blended model uh, on a much greater scale than maybe um, is anticipated with this plan. And I, I, I worry that, I, I anticipate that the blended model will probably look a lot more like the 100% uh, remote learning model uh, much of the time. And within that, I also wanted to emphasize the importance of community and peer connection, uh, specifically with the homeschool. The, um, you know, with the isolation of a pandemic, students, uh, many students have retained a sense of, of belonging um, and affiliation with their homeschool that they, that they count on despite the um, prolonged break. And I don't think they have ever considered that there's a possibility that um, that could be taken away. And I don't think this can be re replaced with a new uh, affiliated remote school concept. Um, and I just worry that that is uh, exclusionary and, and, and frankly feels um, punitive to many parents um, who are considering that route. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Madsen. Hey there, thanks again for um, indulging me and I did wait to chat <laughs> or, or, or participate to let other people of course um, speak. But I, I did wanna go back to the sy synchronous blended learning model. I researched that and learned that's what it's called. And that's what San Jose Unified um, School District is doing. There are many fine private schools who are going in that direction as well. I know of one in particular where we've had a little bit of experience at summer school programs. <laughs> not in California, and the head of school is a scientist, and this is the model that they're going with. And their continuum works for all students, um, whether they are hundred percent want to be 100% virtual, um, regardless of how we flex in and out of a, a, um, a shelter-in-place order. Um, and so much time is being spent on creating these new um, uh, learning and uh, I'm sorry, Sandra, I don't recall what you're calling it, the, the, the instructional plans that just as much time or perhaps less could be spent on how teachers could be doing this um, live streaming model to satisfy both audiences. Um, we're, we're not the first ones to, to think about that. There are effective models um, out there. So um, I still want to make a plug for that. I liked Vladimir's comments that we can be flexible. Um, but if, if we were to consider this model, I, I really would encourage you to, to learn more about it. I think we could put efforts into it to make it more effective. It's not just kids sitting at home and just listening. There are ways um, to engage. 
Um, I would like to encourage you to be more transparent, please, um, Jeff and Sandra. Um, this is the first time I've heard that parents were involved in, in listening to these models. I speak with many people and, and none of us were aware of this. So I, I encourage you to please be more transparent and, and, and engage more of us, please. That's all. Our next speaker, sorry, Brian. Our next speaker is Amy Wang. Hi, um, it's me again. Um, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you're putting in. And this is a very challenging time. And like Vladimir said, we all need to practice tolerance. And I'm hoping I'm practicing that even with my comments and questions. My intentions are for the good of all of our kids and our whole community of LASD. Um, uh, I echo a lot of the comments and questions um, the previous speakers have already raised, specifically to the ventilation and considering opening doors and windows, and therefore there's less touching of handles and things like that, um, considering outdoor classroom um, model as well for the on-campus time. And then also specific to um, providing a stable cohort and educating parents what that really means and the part that we have to do outside of the school hours to ensure the safety of the teachers, the staff, as well as um, our kids and our families. Um, and then I have one very small logistic question because I might have missed it or I, um, I didn't hear it. Um, I heard the question about kids arriving and leaving school um, bikes, but what about on foot if they're um, going by themselves and not accompanied by a parent? And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Jason Leonard. Uh, hi there. <clears throat> Thanks for letting me uh, talk. Um, just um, three quick uh, points. Uh, number one, I, I want to echo what uh, an earlier speaker said as far as uh, the, um, you know, despite all the improvements you've made in, in the remote learning, it's, it's, it is very impressive, but I think it is, you know, an inferior uh, option. And I, uh, you know, I, I think the quality of the education our kids are getting should be the primary focus. And when I hear things like this blended model will persist until the vaccine, I really worry about the, you know, basically the sacrifice of that quality. Um, second point, I, I read the county health re, um, you know, guidelines as, as well as you know, some of the, the state um, uh, language in the education code. And uh, for me, the, the phrase that really jumped out was um, the requirement to offer in-person education to the fullest extent possible. Um, I don't really see that that's being um, done here. Um, I, I think if two days are possible, three and four and five are as well. Um, and finally, um, on, on the topic of um, health versus education trade-offs, I'm, I'm fully aware we have to face those. Um, I would like to see though, those trade-offs made by the health department rather than uh, the board. I think that's where the expertise lies. Um, and at least in some of the comments, I, I think you're exceeding the re, uh, recommendations rather than following them. Um, and you know, along those lines, I don't see any particular reason to think two days is all that much safer than five. Um, uh, I guess that's it, thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Our next speaker is Megan Greenbaum. Hello. Hi. Hi, um, I spoke last week. I am an eighth grade science teacher at Block. Um, I wanted to just echo my comments one more time about the health and safety. I truly am concerned about um, the health and safety for the staff at the junior high level um, and as well as the students. I know that the, I've read the county guide guidelines. I know that the district is going to implement, you know, everything they can to keep um, staff and stu students safe and healthy. But um, the reality of seeing 120 to 150 students a week for staff, even wearing masks, is that, you know, masks aren't 100% effective. And I see students, I see junior high kids out with their friends, they're not wearing masks. And so 
to assume that they're going to be wearing masks all the time when they're outside of their house, I think is just not a reality. Um, and then not only for my health, but I could become then a vector for my students as I am transferring between each class, right? I'm seeing in, in the scenario, I'm seeing students in the A co cohort, I'm seeing four groups of kids every day um, and I'm transferring or Monday and Tuesday and I'm transferring between those four groups. But then I could potentially be, I, I am transferring between that. So, and then I'm going on to my next group on Thursday and Friday, going between four groups of kids. So it isn't just for them transmitting to me, but I'm also thinking about me transmitting anything that I may have picked up to them. And I understand masks and I understand doing our best to social distance, but I just think the reality at that age group, it's still hard to really keep track and make sure that everyone is doing their part. And I really do feel like um, I'm not certain that, you know, keeping the distance and being in a science classroom when we want to work hands on and I want to, you know, have my students, you know, being able to interact with my students. I just am concerned about being able to do that um, at the distance and with masks coupled with the health and safety issue. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leanne Geist. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I think that uh, parents need a bit more understanding and clarity on the, the two different models when children are in the blended model and going to school two days a week. The other three days, how much contact virtually do they have? Are they able to have with their teacher? Because my understanding is that the teacher on the other two days of five days we are going to be with the other group of students and as well the students who choose 100 percent virtual learning how many days a week are they um, being privy to instructional teaching in comparison to the other group um, i would also like to say that i believe that the evidence has shown that masks and social distancing is working um, i would hope that the goal is for all students and teachers to be wearing masks. However, keeping in mind that it is very difficult for children to do this for a short period of time, let alone a full day of school, so that in the school days, I think it would be wise to have uh, specified break times for children to go outside in their own space six feet apart and be able to breathe <laughs> some air, taking off their masks. Um, Somebody mentioned the idea of schooling outside, and so, yes, the virus is much more contained indoors and, and a bigger risk for spread indoors than out. And in California, we're lucky enough we could do outdoor schooling. Um, I think that brings with it a lot of other problems, uh, having children outside. Um, lastly, Sorry, I forget my last question. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. And uh, I do hope our kids get, get back to school. Thank you. Thank you. And as always, feel free to email us at trustees at lasdschools.org when you think of your last question. Our next speaker is Rachel Granger. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Yes. Thank you to everyone for all your hard work. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, just briefly, I just wanted to, to echo the call from earlier. Uh, I think Sandra mentioned earlier she was meeting with some sixth grade teachers, perhaps later this week, to figure out how they could be best be supported. Um, but as the parent of a first time a parent of a rising sixth grader, um, any information you all could share about sixth grade and how that's different from you know K through five, which I know. Um, more intimately uh, would be great. I remember from the last call that one sixth grade teacher um, mentioned um, that it would be helpful to treat sixth grade more like seventh and eighth uh, with block scheduling. I'm not sure, not having ever having had a seventh or eighth grader, uh, what that would look like in either a blended or virtual model either. But um, to the extent there's more clarity on how sixth grade will look in both the virtual only and blended model, um, I would certainly appreciate hearing about that. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Nadia Mashasha. Go ahead. Hi, actually, um, my daughter has been listening in. She's a, a, was a third grader at Covington Elementary, and she just has a question that she'd like to ask. Great. Um, so, uh, my teacher said if we um, need any help with questions or something, we can chat with her on Google Hangouts or email her. And I email her many times and I text her many times, but she doesn't respond to me. She only, she says that she'll get right back to us and she um, responds to me like within 24 hours, if not more. And I end up getting it wrong on my little math test or I end up missing a direction and it's just we we don't really she do, and she just usually gives us directions and when we have questions she can't really get back to them she says and yeah that's it we got another question about sanitizing and how will we be able to sanitize the whole entire school everything how will you be able to sanitize the playground or the lunch tables because we're all going to be sitting on it? And how do you prevent kids from doing weird things like putting their mouth on, touching the water fountain or digging their nose? <laughs> That's it. Thank you. All right, uh, we are out of speakers, so I'm gonna close public comments. Um, and is there anything, Jeff or Sandra, that you guys want to address before we move on to the board, or do you want the board to take, we can let the board, see what the board wants to focus on first? Yeah, I think that's fine, Brian. All right, board members questions and comments. Jessica. Uh, yeah, um, I'm kind of going through uh, some of the questions that I don't think we necessarily covered our first pass um, with the presentation and our questions um, from my copious notes of uh, public comment. Um, so when do we think we'll at least give the, the, co uh, the cohort announcement when we're gonna be picking like the parts of the alphabet My guess is we're not going to be able to do that until we have a good sense of uh, how many people choose the virtual only option. That makes sense. I would hate to tell people one thing and then we get that data information back and then it has to shift, right? Yep. No, that makes quite uh, sense. Um, and All right, if I could just follow up. So you're thinking sort of end of July is what I hear from that? Yeah, because the survey is coming out mid mid July, I guess, I assume next week. Um, correct. Um, and what else? Let me see. Um, there were a couple of questions related uh, to sixth grade. Uh, so do you want to discuss that um, now? Yeah, I, I know our sixth grade teachers are passionate about all of their content areas and we want to make sure that our sixth grade students have their broad um, uh, curriculum opportunities. And uh, I think the bit of the challenge is sixth grade, each of our sixth grade uh, schools, each of the schools have kind of a different sixth grade arrangement and it's always been like that. Some of them do rotations, some of them, because there are only two folks, they do only one rotation, others do four rotations. So we're meeting Thursday to really understand, hopefully if, if everybody can make it, but understand how we can best support them centrally, uh, what their scope and sequence should look like. So if we do have to have sixth graders who are in our virtual program and then perhaps flow back into a classroom that they're um, kind of systematically being taught in a similar scope and sequence and pacing. Um, and then really understanding uh, what the rotation model might look like for sixth grade 
at our different schools because you know some have two, some have three. I don't think anybody will have four this year, but just kind of the, the nuances of what that looks like. All right. Um, and and I guess I'll just add, Jessica, just our, our sixth graders will continue with their um, their historical specials, right? We were we are still offering band and orchestra and music exploration. Uh, virtually, we are um, doing our CSTEM computer science um, course virtually. So they still have that full sixth grade experience. And I know our teachers are really invested in um, making it an exceptional end of elementary school year for students, regardless of our pandemic situation, right? They want to make it a really special year for kids. What do the leadership opportunities look like? All of those things. And how can we make that work virtually or in person partially? <laughs> awesome. Um, and I don't know if I may have co covered this in a prior question, but I guess, um, on how um, on the days the kids are at home um, beyond um, the meets, how are we going to be, how are the kids going to be engaged? What would be uh, a day in a life for them at home in the blended environment? I think on any given Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, students will have a combination of some required live meets for their specials. So their PE teacher, their uh, um, music teacher perhaps, or an art docent lesson or a living classroom lesson. Uh, and so they would have that kind of scheduled time within the day along with their afternoon session with their, with their teacher. And then in between those times is when they are engaged in their learning plan, independent learning, right? They're getting their high quality directed instruction from their teacher through a video or from a teacher through a video. They're doing the tasks that, they're, that their teachers have assigned. They're possibly uploading evidence of that work um, to prepare for their in-person experience coming later in the week or next week. And what if they're having, you know, they're having issues on their, at their home day? Um, uh, what are the expectations of, the, um, of getting an answer or at least from someone um, yeah. I think, yeah, we'll have to, we've been talking about helping teachers kind of set up some systems. We certainly don't want our teachers who are in person working with kids feeling like they have to stop and drop and constantly be monitoring emails or chats or what have you, because again, I think that impacts the quality of the in-person experience that we're happy to be able to bring back. So it's creating a system of, uh, could be parents who volunteer to do some virtual help. It could be a, a Google Doc, depending on the age of kids, right? You have different solutions for different ages of kids, but it could simply be a question doc where a student has a question and is not quite sure how to get going. Very typically, this happens in the classroom all the time. I can't remember if I said this last week, this idea of ask three before me, it's a thing every teacher teaches their students. Don't come to me, the teacher, ask three, fellow students before you come to me and 95% of the time the kids can figure out um, a response and get that student back on track. So it's coming up with, with those systems and making sure that what we're asking kids to do in that independent world is actually independent and um, doable for kids. Yeah, I mean, and I also, uh, a friend had um, come up with a way, another way that we can repurpose parent volunteers. Sure. Um, and that could be another way that they perhaps are um, given an LASD email and, and they are there uh, to answer at least the first line uh, of, of questions. Um, because I don't foresee us having any really parents on campus um, and right. it, it's, it won't be safe. Um, so that's just another way. Um, let me see. I think I may just let everybody else ask some of these questions. And if they're not, I still have all my, uh, oh, last one actually, because um, a bunch of people brought it up. Um, 
have we considered teaching outside um, and what, uh, what were our considerations? What are we trying to do on that front? Well, we're going back to ancient Greek times. <laughs> We all sat under a tree and, and had great discussions. No, I, I do think we want to encourage teachers to have, uh, when it's doable, right, to be able to bring some learning outdoors. It's wonderful for kids, but it's not always practical. So it's finding the nice balance. Almost all of our classrooms, maybe all of them seem to have a little outdoor courtyard area outside one of their doors oftentimes where kids do already go outside and do some work um, or take a break out there or do a small group out there um, and it's just again uh, teaching kids new practices of what might it look like if we all do our mini lesson for reading outside or we take our writing notebooks outside um, what does it look like so we can still be focused and, and get the work done that needs to be done. Yeah, I, I can also foresee some issues where uh, some people are doing something quiet inside where it's noisy outside, but we're trying to have better ventilation. So we have all the windows and doors open. So it's, it's I, I know it's def definitely not gonna be perfect and a lot of coordination will probably have to go into it for sure. Um, I think that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Who would like to go next? Steve? So I think my question, uh, cycle back to something, um, Jeff kind of touched on it. It's, it's, um, thinking more in terms of the migration from this blended model to uh, getting kids on campus in, a, in, a, in a, a way that is safe and is safe for both the instructors as well as the the children and families and i know we've we've had some offline conversations about this we've had some online ones that kind of things got touched on but we've kind of moved over quickly um, at one point we talked about this idea of a six-week cycle where we'd be reevaluating every six weeks and I'm wondering if given the now the the county order which was more a presumptive of a we'd open almost in a, a, a cohort um, um, opened in, in, in five days a week. Um, is there a way of, of evaluating where we are with uh, using our health and safety information that we have coming in and we're monitoring teachers, monitoring families to migrate that to a, a shorter cycle? So it's more like a, every three weeks we're reevaluating. Can we now maybe expand TK and K and one to uh, five days a week. Um, and because we know that the, it seems stable and we now can bring them on, uh, that stability seems to be maintained. Can we now, for a couple, for three weeks, can we now look at doing the next group up? And kind of putting that kind of expectation out there too and kind of looking at, does that, is that feasible? Um, I guess I'm really concerned about the idea of uh, a lot of families are returning back to work um, I, you know, just judging from traffic and stuff and, and what I'm hearing at work. Um, so that the idea of, of the patience that uh, work environments have had around families having to be involved with their children's education at, while they're doing conference calls, while they're doing work that they're supposed to deliver on, um, might be wearing a little thin. Um, so the, the quicker we can move to that sort of idea of a, a, a day at school and, and some thought process layering that into our conversation of, of when, when does that trigger and what are the triggering factors we want to make sure are covered and we're feeling comfortable about before we, we will pull that trigger uh, would be good uh, for me. Um, the, um, you know, given, given guidance that's come from the American Peter Actors Association, the idea of getting us in earlier versus waiting for a vaccine seems not to be where they're headed. They've actually you know, encouraged us to get back to school full-time faster. So I think kind of keeping that in the back of our minds as we try to move forward here would be uh, helpful too. Um, uh, I know there's some other things that are like percolating here, but I, I, think, I think what I'm hearing and, and what I would be struggling with as a parent putting my child in, making a choice for my child is the unknowns about how we're gonna manage this. You know, I know that we, you know, we've, we've heard uh, talk of rotating testing within the staff and teachers and what is, you know, we haven't touched on any of that yet because we haven't 
gone down that next step. But you know, those types of things, details, I think are gonna make a big difference to some families. So the sooner we can get that, start to document some of that, I think would be helpful. Um, the idea that maybe um, it, 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 we ask families to, one, one of the uh, fam, uh, people who sent letters to us actually said, what about asking everyone to quarantine for 14 days before we open or as we open? Um, and, and, and working that into, into the, you know, it's back to this is a cooperative thing. Can we, can we ask families to cooperate with us on that? Because we know that they've been quarantined and they're symptom free coming in. At least we have 14 days of, of stability there. And, and as we open up, can we ramp up a little faster too if we've done that? So those are all um, thoughts I have about how do we make it feel, the staff feel safe for us to go full time. Um, and address some of their, their concerns and issues the best we can. I don't think we never touch on all of them, but what can we do to make um, them feel safe, families feel safe, having their children in, and what, what can we ask the community to do to kind of step in and help us do that? Uh, Jessica's talking about some of the delivery support things we could do, but it, can we ask them, you know, if, if they want us to get to this idea that the county's put out there of a five days a week um, in-person class, what, what what support would we need from them to do to make that that um, happen, and and if you're choosing to stay out, that's fine. But the, you know, the, you know, this is the, the bigger push. I, I think we have a model that talks about virtual, that we can kind of figure out how to deliver. We've 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 talked about how to improve that. We understand how to make that work. We're moving to this live model. It's the staggered live. I think this has a lot of people concerned. And how do we get it to a a live? Uh, which is uh, what we've talked about we would like to do as well. So a little thought around that. I think it, as they're making choices, people are going to want to understand that better. So the more we can do, start to document that, get that out there, I think the better walk will be. Got it. All right, before Shali goes, it is 10 o'clock, so I'm going to need a motion for us to continue our meeting. I move that we continue our meeting. I'll Thank second you. it. Well, see, Vladimir's down one in the count now. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Shali? Yes. Vladimir? A reluctant yes. I vote yes. Uh, motion, motion to continue the meeting <clears throat> passes 5 nothing. And Shali? Go ahead. Brian, how long is that for? Just for the minutes. What's the uh, duration the motion, of the extension? The, the motion allows us to continue indefinitely until somebody moves that we adjourn. <laughs> I believe. I'd like to make, no, never mind. <laughs> Go ahead, Jolly. All right, thank you. Um, you know, a lot of what I've been hearing from the parents, uh, or I should say our speakers, is a lot of this concern over health and safety. And I'm looking at your slides, Jeff, and I know that we're not going to have a, a health and operations plan until late July, but just to kind of- Well, just, if I could just correct, just to clarify, we're not gonna have it in front of the board until the 27th. I think we will have it in draft form and people looking at it prior to that, uh, leading up to that. Okay. So I think a lot of the questions that, that our speakers are asking will probably be covered in that plan. Um, and I know that we're going to be, I'm thinking about this continuum between 100% on campus and 100% virtual. And, you know, what are the, some of the things that we're going to be monitoring or looking at to, to know when we pull that trigger? Like, when do we go to 100% virtual? Um, you don't have to answer that right now, but it might be something to consider um, in the health plan, like just kind of what our indicators will be and what are some of the parameters around those indicators. Um, you know, and thinking about, you know, of course our goal is to move towards 100% in-person instruction, but it's not going to look like business as usual, right? It's not going to be the same level of, you know, kids running around and this, that, and the other, it's, it's going to look very different, I think, personally. Um, what our campuses will look like if we have 100% of our kids um, back on campus. And part of that, 
is a huge part of that, of course, is the health and safety of our students and our staff. And if we really truly want to get to 100% on campus, then we need to move very slowly, I feel very slowly and very deliberately. And like I said, keeping track of, you know, whatever these, whatever indicators we come up with. Um, I think this, I think the blended model is a very responsible way to eventually move us towards 100% on campus because it allows us to kind of go slowly and kind of um, look at some of those indicators and monitor how things are going on campus. So I just w wanted to point that out. Um, let me see. And I think, you know, we just need to be super flexible. You know, we have no idea what this virus is going to do in the fall. We don't know that, that this virus is not going to be its symptoms won't be conflated with the flu and that just makes things so much more complicated and I think a lot of a lot of this a lot of my questions I think will probably be answered in the health uh, and operations plan that, that we see at the end of the month so all right um, Vladimir sorry yeah no no problem um, so Jeff um, I, I would be happy if um, <clears throat> you came back to the board um, after school started with um, a more detailed plan for how to get us from wh where we are to 100%. Uh, I think that doing that right now or, or making that decision now is, is way premature because we, don't have, we simply don't have experience uh, with what school is going to be like um until we open up and uh, see what what what's going to happen um I, i'd like to echo something that i said before um i don't have the experience of uh i i'm not trained in i don't have any experience in pandemics and things like that um the santa clara county health department um does have that experience they do have that knowledge um, and the Santa Clara, Santa Clara County Office of Education <clears throat> also has um, knowledge of all the little details and all the little um, uh, things that you need to take into consideration when you are making a decision like whether to open or not to open, whether to have require masks or not to require masks, and things like that. And so I look to them for the guidance that we ought to follow. Um, I would agree with, uh, I've forgotten who said it, somebody did say, uh, mention the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, uh, urging in-person uh, instruction. They will take that into account and I expect them to process that information and then to, uh, uh, to come back with a recommendation to us on that. For us to take that into account, I think, uh, is beyond our capabilities. My, it's certainly beyond my capability, so I, I don't know about other people. Um, I do agree with Steve about um, the notion of cohorts and how we need to make sure that that notion is extended beyond the school boundaries. Uh, I think that would be a, a, an important um, uh, aspect of making sure that the return is healthy. Um, and I made a comment earlier about, um, I don't think 100% in-person is possible without a vaccine. Um, regardless of what the, the county has uh, uh, mandated, if you want, there are going to be parents who are going to say, I'm not comfortable sending my child um, to, uh, to in school until I am really, really 100% sure that, or not 100% sure, but I really have a much greater sense of uh, 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 that my child won't get sick. Uh, whatever, the, the, whatever the state requirements are, whatever the uh, uh, county recommendations are, until there's a vaccine, you, there's, there's really no um, sort of guarantee, if you want, of that. Um, so if we go back to, to the entire plan here, I guess we're being asked to uh, 
authorize this plan. But I've heard uh, enough questions about sometimes details, sometimes fairly uh, significant uh, issues. I'm comfortable in authorizing uh, or, or voting for you to continue along these general lines using this general plan as an outline. Um, but to sort of like fix it in, in concrete, uh, that I'm not. Um, so I, if, if we're being asked to do the, the, the former, in other words, continue along this general path, I'm, I'm okay with that. But if, if it's approved this the way it's put together, uh, I think there are enough open questions at least uh, that I'm uncomfortable doing that. And I don't know what uh, the other board members or what Jeff you were asking or uh, Brian, what you think that uh, the action item uh, encompasses. So perhaps somebody can say something about that. Well, um, so I'd like to offer a few questions and comments myself first, um, and then I'll circle back around to Vladimir's question about um, action items. Um, I think the rest of you um, have covered most of the questions that I've heard from email and from our speakers tonight, um, I would, with maybe a couple of exceptions. Somebody did ask about um, contingencies when there's a COVID-19 positive among one of our students or staff or community members. Um, I would encourage them to look at the, the county guidance has a lot of detail around that, around exactly what they are going to require. Um, and the requirements in that document are legally binding orders as far as we're concerned. So those are the things that will happen at an absolute minimum, I suppose, you know, we may in some circumstances end up sending more people home than they absolutely require to be sent home. Um, but there is, I think, a lot of detail there. On the other hand, I was on a call today and Dr. Cody said explicitly that they are deferring to school districts to make these trade-offs, right? What we are hearing is that the, the people who are experts at education will tell you that the most effective way to generate education by and large is in person on campus. And the people who are experts in keeping people safe will tell you that the best way to keep people safe is to keep them in their homes and never talk to anybody who isn't a member of your family. And circumstances differ so far across communities, across school districts, that neither group wants to take on that trade-off. So unfortunately, as with so many things in education, we're caught between two um, sort of competing interests. And I, th I think we are going to have to make some of these calls. Um, as best we can. Um, I would like actually, Sandra, if you can comment at least a little bit on content differentiation for students who have, who need certain accommodations, you know, subtitling, vision issues, hearing issues, if we have any, any detail around that. Yeah, absolutely. We would, uh, depending on the particular student and the need, right? Many of our students in that situation might have a case manager if they're a part of a special education or have a 504 for specific accommodations. If it's not that formalized, we would work with the classroom teacher and the principal to support the needs with the family, of course, um, to support the needs of the student. Um. Okay, and I, I imagine it will be a little bit of a work in progress given that we're building all of this on the fly, but um, but certain families who have those, is it fair to say that families that have those kind of concerns should reach out sooner rather than later to their principals and, and to you just to, to let you know what they're thinking? Sure, yeah. You would know. <laughs> or, well, I mean, I'm I, assuming I would, that- Brian, I would say, yeah. I, I think, um, I mean, if we wanna, I see Jennifer Kiker is here, our special education director. She can probably comment on that um, if she raises her hand, uh, if she's able to. But short of that, um, there she is. I think several of us clicked. Go ahead, Jennifer. She's on the beat. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, Jen. Yes. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. I've um, sent out a lot of communication for parents if they. Um, if the child receives accommodations under an IEP, um, 
we are working with those families to make sure their accommodations are implemented. And I would say the same for 504s. If a child is under a 504 with accommodations, psychologists are the case managers generally, and they've been reaching out with families and will continue to do so, um, especially before school starts to make sure that those accommodations are needed. If they have accommodations outside of anything formalized, we are still there to support them. And so I would say to reach out to the school psychologist at their site, they could really make sure that they can facilitate those accommodations for each child. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jennifer. You're welcome. Um, so something else that occurred to me, um, can you talk a little bit more about the 100% virtual option in terms of how it will be different than the at-home portion of the of the blended option? Just in terms of, we've heard a lot about, you know, there's a lot of work being done to get the sort of remote, to get these lesson plans set up such that they can be delivered in person or remote. So will the 100% virtual option be sort of those same set of lesson plans yep. with the in-person stuff done in small groups? Correct. So instead of having the in-person, uh, instead of having your small group just done on two days, I would think of it more as having your, your small group uh, more individualized live happening throughout the five days. So is the choice, is, is, or is the, the distinction there between 100% virtual students being kind of part of their home school or part of this sort of district-wide virtual school, is that just down to staffing or are there other things, staffing and numbers or are there other things driving that? Primarily staffing and numbers. Okay. So it's, okay. So with the, just the details as with so much, so much of this are a little bit TBD. Yep. So there's, yeah. I sort of understand why you can't, you don't want to promise things you can't necessarily. But I think we all understand the, as some of the, want, some of the, some of the speakers mentioned, I think we all would agree that sort of keeping them as connected as possible to their home school is, is what we want to do, so. Certainly. Yes, agreed. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a comment um, based on something Vladimir said earlier about um, families who opt for 100% virtual because I think there's been a little bit back and forth in different districts about this as well. Because um, the first draft the county came out with said that the student would have to be medically fragile, then they amended that in their later guidance to say student or family member. You know, if we feel like we have to have the family check a box to say I am concerned about my student or family member, that's fine. I personally wouldn't be in favor of demanding some sort of documentation um, subsequent to that. I think there are all sorts of issues around that, around privacy, equity, whatever else. So I don't want to be our district to be in the business of trying to verify that. Because so that's just my, my personal take there. Um, so let's see. So coming back around to Vladimir's question, unless anybody else has other comments immediately, coming back to Vladimir's question about action. <clears throat> um, as I had sort of thought through this, it seemed to me that there's sort of three, and based on your slides here, it seemed to me that there's sort of three underlying <clears throat> questions for potential action or direction, maybe. Um, and in sort of, I wanna say, and this is my interpretation of descending order of urgency. So we have the draft learning plan. And obviously, I think that you guys have communicated that you need to proceed with details here. We need to turn this into nine different site operational plans. So, and you can correct me, you sort of need to know whether that, whether the board approves of that direction in terms of, at least at the framework level of, we're gonna have this continuum of education that runs from in-person to virtual, it's going to be flexible in that students can opt into 100% virtual, but otherwise how many students we have on campus is going to be determined by safety of students and staff, which is going to be driven by pandemic conditions, county guidance, um, all the rest of that. And, um, and, and the plan in its details is obviously going to have to be flexible enough that individual students, individual classrooms, entire school sites and the whole district 
can shift along that continuum as circumstances and county health orders warrant. That's correct. <laughs> um, is what do other boards, so now I'm looking to my other board members and seeing if somebody wants to try to offer a motion along those lines, whether we want to try to drill down on the details. I mean, I think we, I, I think I personally, you know, I understand the teacher concerns. I have faith that Jeff and Sandra are gonna work with the teachers, especially in the upper grades where things aren't as well defined. Um, to address those concerns. I don't think it's in none of our interests, board, parents, teachers, anybody for teachers to get sick. So, you know, we definitely want that. Everybody wants that first and foremost. So I think we're all agreed on that. Um, you know, and we're, I think we understand all the parents drivers around their education and everything else. There's a lot of details still be worked out. Um, but personally, I, I do feel like we need to give staff some concrete, yes, you're on the right track approval at this point for them to do the work that needs to come over the next few weeks. So I would be prepared to offer a motion. I, let, me, let me make a motion um, to authorize Jeff and staff to proceed on the general path that has been outlined in the presentation so far and to come back to us at a later date with uh some more detailed instruct uh, some more detailed plans on exactly how we're going to get back to a hundred percent and perhaps october might be a good time for, for that Can we have October not be a part of your motion, just for clarity? I withdraw October. We'll skip October. <laughs> Anyone interested in seconding that motion? Can I discuss something before I, I second it? Um, sure. I, I, I think we uh, technically, sorry, it's late, so I'm gonna get pedantic. Technically I'm we need to- he motions. <laughs> sorry, what? I was gonna talk before he motions. <laughs> Well, the motioning does not, first of all, the motion does not cut off discussion. Second of all, technically we need a second in order to discuss this motion. All right, I, I second the motion. All right, further discussion. <laughs> yes, Jessica. <laughs> Sorry, I'm punchy past 10. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to emphasize that I kind of see this like our, our budget. We passed our budget um you know at the beginning of june knowing that we would it, it would likely change and that's what i see i see i see that we're approving this continuum of instruction knowing that we're going to get more details uh later and i absolutely know that uh sandra and team will be working hard uh to that effect um as, as is jeff will be too um, so I, I just wanted to kind of emphasize this is not unlike uh, the budget. It's just a, it's a way different beast, um, but it's, it's the same. Uh, it's an apt analogy, um, I think. Um, and then I also. Um, yes. That yeah. was the intent of my motion is to allow that to occur. Yeah, exactly. Um, and just that then we also give direction to staff to come back with some um, some gates or uh, pr principles, indicators uh, for how, how we would know that we're safe to start going um, more fully back um, to, you know, I guess 90% of, of, of kids in school um, is, is so, I, I, so I agree to it. It's a long-winded way of me saying, yes, I agree. <laughs> or, or Jessica, or the opposite direction, because we started in the middle with blended, and if indicators are going downhill, then we end up going to, you know, so I would really, I, yes. So I agree with the motion and the seconding. I would, but I think that the instructional plan is going to be, it'll go hand in hand with the health and operations plan. Yep. Because I feel like you can't, um, they're, they're both two halves of the same coin, you know? Yep. So. Okay. Um, Steve, anything? 
I agree with what Charlie's saying. I mean, there's just a lot of unanswered questions in the moment and some structure around that whole health and safety side is going to help you inform what you're going to do as you as you choose which which model you want to go with initially and how you transition out. So those details, as both Jessica and, and Shelly and Vladimir all indicated, are going to be key to families making choices. So the more we can articulate those, make those very clear, the easier they are for everyone to absorb this and take it on. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as we've discussed ad nauseum, as the county has said, things are going to shift. We need a plan that allows for that shift. Um, I think beyond that, the only question is some of the AB details, which I think, as people have said, are a little bit more worked out on the, the lower grade end, um, a little bit less worked out on the higher grade end. So some of that will change. Um, I appreciate you, Sandra, you running through um, all of sort of the options that that we looked at, you know, I think we're not going to come up with anything that that makes everybody 100% happy because it's all about choosing the least bad option at some point. Um, and so I think we just need to to make a choice. Um, and I'm sort of confident that a reasonable amount of work has gone into the into this. I know a tremendous amount of work has gone into this. Um, Jeff, is there anything that you need other than the motion as provided on just this question around the the overall continuum and framework? for the learning plan? Uh, no, that's all we need at this point moving forward. All right, then we have a motion and a second. Unless anybody has anything else, I'm going to call the roll. Steve. Yes. Charlie. Yes. Vladimir. Yes. Jessica. Yes. I vote yes. Motion carries five nothing. Um, so there was oh, a second uh, question. Oh, Claire. So there was a second question, I think, about whether we wanted to um, take a vote, board, uh, a board vote now about um, whether we were going to start day one in blended or virtual or wait and see mode. Um, so I will say, I mean, personally, Blended seems like the only way to start, given that, as people have said, we're going to train 4,000 students, several hundred staff, and probably 10,000 parents on entirely new procedures around school. And given that everybody's health and safety is our paramount um, concern, it seems not aligned with that to imagine that we're going to go back day one with everybody. At the same time, a lot of um, there's been a lot of discussion about building connections with teachers, building connections with classmates. It's a little hard for me to see how especially the younger students can really start day one and get off to a good start, not in their classroom, you know, just looking at the same screen that, that they've been looking at for the last six months. Um, so unless now things may shift, we may be unable to start with kids on campus if conditions deteriorate. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it makes sense to sort of aim for the middle of the spectrum day one. Um, so I think I, I would be prepared to say, to put us on record as saying that's what we're going to do, if that would be helpful, Jeff, and if other board members are willing to go down that road. That's what I thought I was motioning for, so yes. <laughs> so would you like to be on record as making that motion? Yes. I, um, I mean, there is one. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, Vladimir, what? I don't believe it's on the agenda, right? I said the re well, the reopening plan in general is on the agenda for action. So we've had one motion to approve the learning plan generally, and now we have another motion to officially make it official that we will start in some form of blended part of the week on campus, part of the week off campus. We can have multiple motions per agenda item as long as they're on the same topic. Okay. Yes, so uh, I do move uh, that we start in blended learning for pretty much all the reasons you said. Second. Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> um, any further comment? Any questions? I just make a comment, Brian. Absolutely. 
Right. So I just I just want to acknowledge the. I know we have a lot of people listening here as well. Some have dropped off, but um, appreciate all the comments. Um, I do want uh, to make it clear that we are. This is a wildly complicated situation. We are committed to working with our working with our teachers uh, to to make this work. Um, working with our parents to ensure this works for our students. Um, you know, education is at the heart of what we do. It is our, it is our core mission. Um, but more than that, um, the health and safety of everyone involved uh, really, really supersedes that. And um, this is one of those very delicate situations and we don't have them often, but we have one right in front of us um, this year due to this pandemic. And so it is in our interest to make sure that we hit um, as sweet a spot as we can to really allow it to work for all involved. And it is gonna be difficult and it is gonna be challenging. It has been already and it will continue to be, but um, I do have the confidence with everyone you know, in this community and working in this organization that we, we will pull it together and we will get to where we need to get to um, by, by opening day. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And I think, I mean, I also think we, in some ways we don't have a lot of choice about aiming for blended because we have the state mandate that says that we have to be on campus as much as practice as students we're directed to provide in-person education to the greatest extent practicable and while keeping everybody safe. So unless the county health order says that it's not safe to have anybody on campus, I think we have to see what we can practically safely provide by starting with a subset of, of students and then seeing where that goes. Hopefully very well, but we will of course need everybody's help to do that. All right. I will stop talking since it's late and I will call the roll. Steve. Since I thought that's what we already voted on, yes. <laughs> Shally. Yes. Vladimir. Yes. Jessica. Yes. I vote yes. The arguably redundant but extra clear motion <laughs> passes five nothing. Um, all right, so the last question here was that uh, Jeff had put in his presentation was about the road to getting to 100% in person. Um, so I'm not sure that we can provide concrete, or uh, I, don't, I don't know that we need action here unless Jeff, you feel that you do. I think a couple of us provided direction already. Um, I think I broadly agree with what they already provided. It's obviously gonna be um, a mix of the county health department. So for lower grades, as you've said, the county health department has indicated arguably we could already be 100% under certain circumstances, which obviously we're gonna have to see if we can get there safely, which is gonna be not just what we as the board or you as administrators feel are, are comfortable with, but also what our parents are comfortable with, what our teachers and staff are comfortable with, how things actually go. Um, for the upper grades, I think conditions would have to significantly improve for the county health orders to, to allow us to get there. Um, so obviously it's gonna be county health orders, um, actual conditions on our schools, everything else. Anybody else have any additional direction you wanna provide? I'm sure you can follow up over email if you're a little foggy given the hour. Jeff, do you think you feel like you have enough on that? Score I do. I, I took some notes from the comments uh, earlier, including yours now, and I think there's enough to go forward with and bring back the board back um, uh, some models. Okay. Um, so to be clear, the current plan is on July 27th. You will come back to us with any updates to the learning plan that you've made, plus uh, what was it, operations and health and safety other plan. Health and safety plan. That's correct. That's correct. Um, okay. Anybody else have anything else on this item? Unfortunately, we're not done. We got one more thing. All right, moving on to F3. City of Los Altos, LASD schools subcommittee meeting. So Brian, uh, Shali and I are on that. Um, yep. I'd like to propose that uh, um, 
Oh, let's see. Uh, that people send, uh, a board member sent to Jeff a uh, list of questions that they think that uh, need to be answered or asked at that meeting. And then Jeff then brief us uh, on that. If that is um, legally uh, allowed, I, I'm not 100% sure that. Um, uh, I think it's sufficient. Given, given the hour, I believe it is given, and this is a discussion item anyway, I believe it is sufficient to say that we each, to the extent we have potential agenda items for the city school subcommittee meeting, should send them to Jeff. Unless anybody is dying to express them at this moment. The only question I have, is there one scheduled or are we just in it? So we got, sorry, yeah, um, we got an outreach from um, Nisa Flygor to have uh, Marcy reach out to city staff to schedule, finally, a city school subcommittee meeting. <clears throat> So we're not sure when yet, given that our staff is a little bit busy with other things, but is hopefully in progress. I think it's supposed to be at the end of July. Is that right? I think that's what we're aiming for. Uh, we are waiting to hear from the city if there is urgency here that it happen in July or if it can wait until um, a bit later when we might have more time. The only item that I can think of that will be on uh, that I would suggest is on that list is um, uh, uh, openings of uh, schools, um, secondary and tertiary openings of schools, uh, gates in schools. Um, it seems to me we've talked about that before, but I, I somehow or other it's never been resolved. So right. this would be a perfect time to uh, to bring that up again. I would agree. That was I think. We need to get as many entrances into our schools, especially with this pandemic. Um, and also, I, I actually hadn't thought about it right about now. Entrances, we can close them while they're in school. Um, I, I think we also should um, see how they can help us as it relates to safety of them getting into school, whether it is by bike, whether it is during that staggering. Um, I'm. I'm realizing we're not gonna have, we won't have parent help for traffic duty. Uh, so there are just a lot of things we have to think about where the, the city could actually help us to some extent, whether it's you know on their edge of campus or whatnot. Um, anyway, that's it. So Jeff, are you okay with uh, what we've come with so far, which is basically the final stuff through you? You're young. Which is basically what? Um, we'll, just, we'll, we'll send you agenda items to the extent we have them. Yes. To collect. Yeah, that, that works well. Okay, okay, cool. All right. In that case, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.